Hello guys, welcome to Atomic, in this video we will see. What if Deku had an op Vemon quirk, original fanfiction name. Symbiotic hero by. Nightwalker summary. All in all, it is dangerous, unstable, and seems to have a negative relationship with its user, which is not safe for those who are born with such emitter type quirks. The doctor stated from his report. Aizawa narrowed his eyes. Just how unstable are we talking? Venom, Izuku quirk if you enjoy these kinds of stories don't forget to show us some love by hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel also give support to the author of the story link in the description your support means the world to us now let's dive into the story chapter one absentee aizawa shoto rubbed his eyes groggily as he slunk his way towards the front entrance of his classroom ignoring passers-by as he continued his slow motions up the stairs he obviously didn't care. What people thought of his yellow sleeping bag, otherwise he would never wear it out of his house, much less slink his weight forward, using the opened bottom of the bag to carry himself forward in small steps. Taking one of his apple nutrient packs out from inside his capture gear, he began to suck the liquid down, having not eaten breakfast due to his inability to be home. The bags under his eyes felt heavy, dragging his face down to the point where he would rather be at home sleeping with his shitty cat on his chest than coming to work and having to teach a bunch of brats. Working a shift before the first day of school did that to you after all. Finishing the pack, he threw it into the nearest garbage can before he rounded a corner, already hearing the commotion from all the way down the hall. He narrowed his eyes, catching sight of a few figures standing in the doorway of class 1A. He huffed. It seemed this year was going to start off with an interesting beginning already. Not having the energy to walk, he proceeded to let himself fall to the floor softly, the cushioning of his bag slowing his fall. What happened next was a slithering motion, resembling that of a snake or caterpillar moving across the freshly waxed floors of the UA facilities. It was good that all the other classes were already inside or making their way to the orientation. Aizawa preferred not to be stepped on. Hey Anyo, what's that? A girl with bouncy brown hair had finally pointed him out as he made it to the door. His movements had ceased just a few moments before, so there he lay, giving a bland and uneven look to the child who finally took the time to see him. He found several other sets of eyes finally turned to him, to which he gave a bit of a smile, which seemed to have the desired effect of making them uneasy. You wasted 11 seconds standing there talking. If you want to make friends, do it on your own time. Aizawa finally took the energy to stand up pulling himself up by the yellow sleeping bag and removing himself from the comfy confines. The blue-haired boy, the girl, and another boy with red hair all watched him pull a set of blue and white uniforms out of his yellow sleeping bag, marked up with special characters for Ua all the way from top to bottom. Before we begin, I want all of you to put on these. He handed a set to the red-haired boy, before continuing down the line. Some gave him concerned looks. Others even outright complained about putting on clothes he had in his sleeping bag, but he paid it no mind. He had no time for their time wasting. After all, he was certain that one of these brats would be out of his class by the end of the day. As he handed the last one to the Todoroki boy, who took the clothes with indifference, he cast a glance into the now empty room. There were no other students inside, yet he had one uniform remaining, a medium sized set of boys' gym clothes. But which student decided not to come? He shrugged his shoulders, deciding that if they thought to go to the orientation or to not even show up on the first day, then it wasn't his fault that they would be refused entry into his class. Still, there was something nagging him about the mysterious absence. He swore he knew which student it was, he just couldn't put his finger on it. Perhaps he needed more sleep. With a sigh, he trudged his way to the locker rooms, preparing his next string of commands to see what his students were made of and to see if they could even stand in the intensity that was Ua. Bakugo, what was your furthest throw in middle school? 76 meters. With that, a ball was placed into the boy's hand. Try using your quirk this time. Aizawa watched as the fire seemed to ignite in the boy's eyes, who nodded casually before taking his place into the circle. Aizawa gave the quick instruction of staying. Within the circle before allowing the boy to prep himself, taking a step back and setting the recording system to track the ball and its distance. Bakugo wound his arm back, stretching the muscles in his hand and shoulders before swinging his arm forward, a look of fury now. Marrying his features. Die! The blonde screamed into the air, the ball shooting into the sky. 
several rings of smoke puffing up around the path traveled as it made its course through the air. As the ball did so, Aizawa couldn't help but think about something else. The way that the ball flew into the air, as if shooting off the ground and slamming into the air. It wasn't as though he had not seen those balls being fired such distances, but for some reason, he was thinking of something else. Possibly, someone else. Then it struck him at the forefront of his mind, like a bullet out of Snipe's barrel. A name he muttered said word under his breath, only half a second later his screen notifying him of the score. Putting that name into the back of his mind under future use, he swiveled the screen to the peers of the blonde, who all gawked about the score, some of them now making comments about how much fun this was going to be. With those words, Aizawa couldn't help but smile vindictively at them, a shiver going up each of their spines at what their sensei was planning. Midoriya. Principal Nezu, who was waiting for his tea to finish at the kettle, turned around to face the scruffy man who was looking at him. Both of them were currently in the break room, where Aizawa was usually found napping, and Nezu constantly kept tea brewed so he had enough to drink. Aizawa's class was currently in their mathematics class with ectoplasm, where they would then be taken to their next class, hero training. Oh! Nezu gave an inquirous look to the man. Is that the name of the student you decided to expel this year? I'm surprised to hear only. One name this time. The small mammal said with a bit of cheer, going to the lower pantries to grab several cubes of sugar and his collection of teaspoons that only he used. No Mineta Minoru was the one I got rid of this year, but that's beside the point. Aizawa sat down on the couch with a sigh, casting a lazy glance to his side, where in his peripherals, Nezu was now moving his kettle off the burner to cool for a few moments before he served it. Midoriya Izuku. Scored 13 combat points, 50 hero. Points. His quirk wasn't labeled, but based on what I remember seeing, it's a mutation quirk of some kind. The problem is, he wasn't here for class today. Aizawa looked up at the ceiling, going over in his mind what he had recently read, based on the file he was given on the boy. While he made sure to read each file before meeting his students, he took it upon himself to judge them internally based on what he read and how they performed when he had witnessed them during the Entrance exams. He usually decided on which students to kick out right from the beginning, but this year, he was curious. The class he was given was very widely margined, varying from highs in combat and no rescue points, where others were only able to get in from a few extra points that they had managed to garner from helping others. Last year was just a group of talentless, overconfident brats who thought their quirks were all they needed to be go well for them. Not in class. Nezu responded pouring two cups of hot tea and placing it on a tray to bring to the table in front of the couch, where Aizawa was fighting his internal fatigue. To Nezu, he himself was curious about this information. Usually students will send a notification regarding their lack of attendance, or send back a refusal to attend UA after letters are sent to their homes. Only a few had declined, like a student who decided to attend Shiketsu instead along with several others in general ed who took up offers at other high schools rather than attending the bottom of the barrel, as some had put it. Aizawa, seeing the hot cup of tea set in front of him pulled himself up and nodded in thanks to the principal. He picked up the hot cup, holding it gingerly in one hand. I thought about asking Bakugo. Katsuki, the boy who scored highest this year, about the absence. He went to the same middle school as Midoriya, but based on his attitude, I doubt I will receive much useful information. Nezu nodded his head, taking a moment to sip from his cup of steaming brew before turning to Aizawa and smiling up at the man. Well, I guess we'll just have to find out ourselves, E.H. Aizawa pinched his brow, not even meeting the boy yet and he was already a problem child. There were several scenarios that Aizawa Shoda was expecting. After all, it was not every day that he had to visit a student after class was over much less an absent student who was already on questionable regards due to his lack of quirk registration on his school application. However, Principal Nezu was curious, and when the principal was curious about something, there wasn't anyone who could stop him on his journey towards that piece of knowledge, it was why they were making their way down a quiet walkway, pulling away from the more busy parts of the city and entering the residential areas of the Shizuoka district. However, they did not stop there, they had to go further. Aizawa cast looks around the area, not liking the environment. The nicer streets of the resident district had ended several blocks ago, and the subtle changes in the atmosphere were now much more prevalent. Trash was strewn lazily on the streets, 
While not enough to cause outrage from let's say the city sanitation committee, it was much more considerable than what should be normal. He wanted to escort the principal somewhere more savory before continuing, but he could tell the hyper-intelligent animal teacher had that gleam in his eye, and even attempting to get him to leave would not work. Unsavory individuals were passing by, some casually flexing their quirks in an attempt to impress or intimidate those around them. Both UA staff members remained silent on the journey, knowing better than to call these people out on illegal quirk use at the moment. Even making a report would probably be useless, what with the massive amount of what Aizawa called gang witnesses, who always seemed to say that they never used their quirks, and the police would be forced to listen when there was a dozen with the same story. Aizawa continued to watch for possible danger, while at the same time having a different outlook on the problem child. Despite not meeting the boy, it was clear he was not in the best circumstances if he lived in this area. He just hoped that whoever the boy lived with, it was enough to help keep the boy hopeful about his prospects regarding the future. Well, this seems to be it. Aizawa pulls his glances away from a pair of seedy individuals. He turned his full attention back to where Nezu was looking, who made a stop in their trek. His tired eyes widened. This could explain why the boy had yet to attend, Nezu said softly. The apartment complex was in ruins. While half of it seemed to be standing upright, the brick and mortar of the base withholding its weight, it was clear that nobody lived in it, at least in the middle area. The entire center zone of the complex was rubble. Charred marks and ashes seemed to litter the walls around where it tried to stand. The upper levels of the complex were caved in on the lower decks most likely from the wooden support beams being burned up and forcing too much weight on the lower bearings of the apartment. However, Nezu zeroed in on the numbers farthest from the right on the apartment complex, where the third floor was still standing. He counted from that side down the path making it to the end, but then mentally calculating the distance from where the next door would land and continuing on. As he counted, his desired number landed, right in the middle of where everything collapsed. Midoriya Izuku Jishoda Apartment Complex, Number 327. Nezu said out loud, pulling Aizawa's eyes in on himself. Well, at least. Where know why, but where? It only took a few calls from Principal Nezu to pull up information regarding Midoriya Izuku, as well as his possible whereabouts. Being the principal of UA, as well as the principal of a missing student had its advantages. It also helped that one of the lead detectives, Naomasa Sukachi, was a friend of Ua and tended to assist in hero calls and UA-based incidents, this one being no different. The man was quick to help, pulling up the file on the young man, as well as any documents that might have been put into the system regarding his current position. Everything from missing persons reports, eyewitness to hero events, and government facility documentation. After only 35 minutes, they found exactly where the boy was, it was a shock to everyone. While I understand you are within your rights to see the patient, there are several things you must know before you go near his room, let alone speak to him. The doctor explained, looking over the scruffy individual and the small bear? Dog? Raccoon? Mouse? Along with them was Detective Sukachi, who drove both of them to the Yamanashi Psychiatric Center. Apparently Midoriya Izuku was admitted immediately after a fire had broken out in the apartment he was residing in, which led to seven injured and one dead. The fire caused the collapse in the building but apparently the boy was manic outside of the complex when police arrived. Hence, why he was brought here instead of a normal hospital. Why is the boy here? Aizawa asked bluntly, casting a lazy, but focused glance at the doctor. There was a report on why he was sent here, but it was vague regarding what occurred at the apartment complex. The doctor nodded, gesturing for the small group to follow him. Let's take the conversation somewhere more secluded. With that, the three of them found themselves brought to a small office space, where the doctor pulled a file from his desk, filing through it before lodging his finger inside of it, pulling out a small stack of papers and sliding the rest away back from where he pulled them. Midoriya Izuku, age 15. Birthday. July 15th. Blood type. O negative. Quirk, we have been calling it several names, but it doesn't seem to react positively to any of them. It, Aizawa asked, to which the doctor nodded. Unless you are his next of kin or guardian, I am unable to provide much information to you, even if you are his teachers. He is currently a ward of the state, meaning that his medical information is privy only to certain individuals. The doctor began, pushing his glasses up and leveling a look at the group. 
However, it was Nezu's turn to speak, who smiled through the man's whole explanation. Well, it is quite nice that Ua has a law in place for just such a system. The small mammal like principal clapped his hands together. At UA, if any student were to fall under the ward of the state, his guardianship would be handed off to the Hero Academy unless there is a next of kin that contests such a declaration. The doctor raised an eyebrow at the mammal, and was about to refute such a statement when Detective Sukachi reached into his briefcase, pulling out a small set of forms, as well as several copied laws specifically tailored to what the principal explained. The doctor took a few moments to read over such papers before resigning GH before leveling a tired look at them. Very well, but only faculty of Ua are privy to this information unless it is specifically needed by Detective Sukachi and he has a warrant for such information. Nothing against you sir, but patient confidentiality is constantly challenged at this facility. The detective smiled, bowing his head. No I understand completely, I will be outside if you need me. The man stood up, excusing himself outside of the room and closing the door, leaving only the doctor and two pro heroes. Why is Midoriya Izuku a ward of the state? In our files, it said his father is alive and is his guardian, the scruffy man requested. There was a pause the doctor blinking a few times before pulling the file up to eye level. Perhaps we should start from the beginning. Midoriya Izuku was admitted here after reports of not being able to control his quirk. From eyewitness reports, there was screaming and the sounds of conflict within room 327. A few moments later, he burst out of the flaming Jishoda apartment complex, his quirk fully activated, but he was also on fire and yelling loudly. He was throwing around debris and brick from the building screaming at police and attempting to charge at them, before he suddenly started wailing before his quirk receded. Approximately eight minutes later, the upper deck of the complex collapsed, even as pro-hero backdraft attempted to douse them. Eight casualties, with seven injured and, one death. Nezu nodded his head softly. I'm guessing the death was his father? To which the doctor nodded, continuing. Yes. His mother had passed in childbirth, leaving custody with Midoriya Hisashi. While I cannot say for certain, there is obvious mental trauma with the patient. He is apologetic and has a level of self-disgust and shame regarding himself that is quite rare. I recommend you approach with extreme caution. The doctor slid to the next page. Next is his quirk. When he was brought in, it was not active, giving us the opportunity to heal his wounds. However, now that it is active, it refuses to leave. As I asked before, it, Aizawa asked. I'm guessing it is an emitter type quirk with a personality of its own. The doctor lightly glared at the tired looking gentleman, not liking to be interrupted, before continuing. It refuses to let anyone in unless they have food, though it has threatened to eat several of our staff, on one occasion it came close, but the patient seemed to be able to pull it in before going into shock. However, our doctors, myself included, refused to go in during that time, because it was only a few moments later that the quirk was active again hovering over the now then unconscious patient. All in all, it is dangerous, unstable, and seems to have a negative relationship with its user, which is not safe for those who are born with such emitter type quirks. The doctor stated from his report. Aizawa narrowed his eyes. Just how unstable are we talking? Chapter 2. Contained it was dark, but he didn't mind that. He was used to it. More often than not, he would find the landlord had shut their power off, leaving him to work by flashlight. It wasn't the dark that he didn't like, no. However, IT tended to be harder to see in such a low lit environment. The lack of light made things easier for IT. I can hear you. He tenses around himself more than he already was, feeling more like a loaded spring, tightening around his core. He knew it was useless, especially with how IT was connected to him, but it brought him a semblance of comfort, feeling his own hands holding him and not letting go. If you keep calling me IT, I will consider eating one of your organs, child. Please don't, he whispered into his own mind, feeling tears prickle at his eyes. He hated how easy it was for his eyes to water, but he couldn't help it at a time like this. His stomach churned with extreme discomfort. He had not received anything to eat in a while, and the portions were always so small, even with his minuscule appetite. I, no, regardless of what to call him, always hungry for more always whispering about eating something. Someone. It terrified him, and he didn't want to lose control for even one second and let IT take. Contro, I told you not to call me that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sore. Q 
quiet. Someone is coming. Maybe with food. Maybe as food. He could feel elation build inside of him for the other's emotions, but it only added to his own fears. He mentally prepared himself, taking a few unsuccessful breaths to calm himself. He stared down at the floor, counting the tiles, waiting for whoever may enter. He could feel the movement around the room, signaling him to what was being planned without his own volition. Usually the person, whoever they were in the place, would check through the tinted window to see him before entering. The lights would be flickered on from the outside light switch, then after a few moments, a tray of food would be brought in and the individual would scramble out while he kept his best control over the other. It was basically routine now, it didn't mean that he liked it in the slightest. Just outside of the room, three figures had yet to flip the lights on. One was now propped up on another's shoulder, his small form easily able to be supported by the scruffy individual who was holding him with a hand. The doctor reached for the light switch, preparing for whatever he would be forced to see in the room. It was never pretty, but the quirk seemed to have gotten creative lately with the items that were still in the practically Spartan room. However, a hand stopped his movement, the scruffy man next to him holding his fingers from the switch. I see movement, but not normal, he stated. You said that when you turn on the lights, it untints the window, correct? The doctor nodded with a hint of concern. Well, it's a good thing that Aizawa san is used to looking through darkness. The small mammalian individual stated, he didn't want the boy to know that they were observing him, just in case the unstable quirk was active. Aizawa nodded, putting on his goggles and peering through the not only tinted windows, but also into a darkened room. While it had no clear light advantage on his vision, Aizawa always found it easier to see in the night when his eyes were concealed within his yellow visor. He narrowed his vision taking in the room's layout and scanning from side to side. However, in his search, he paused. There is a massive, something, hanging close to the door, he stated out loud, to which the doctor tensed the slightest. The small principal caught the movement, turning his attention to the doctor. Said Dr. Grimmest. That, would be his quirk. It's active, and most likely waiting for the door to open to strike. He said with a bit of apprehension. Both the principal and teacher could tell the man was not comfortable with the quirk, based on his body language and his shifting of his hands on the clipboard he was carrying. Can he hear us? The principal asked, to which the doctor nodded, pointing to a button on the side in between where the door window met the wall. Press that button and it forms a two-way system for communication. They're in place of all our rooms in case, incidents occur. Aizawa nodded, pressing his finger against the button and holding it down. Just above it, a light flashed green, signaling its activation. Midoriya Izuku. Principal Nezu stated evenly. There was a pause, with no movement able to be traced inside of the room. He waited a few more moments before beginning again. Midoriya Izuku. I am here regarding your current situation, from Ua High School. This time there was movement, but not from the mass currently still holding itself in certain parts of the room. No, this time it came from the corner. Aizawa narrowed his eyes. A small form in the corner gave the slightest jostles, but with the lack of lighting, it was hard to tell what it was. Nezu continued regardless. We are here after hearing about the latest situation that has come to light. Today was the first day you did not attend. He said with a slight bit of cheer, trying to coax the boy out. Luckily we will not hold that against you. After all, your safety is more important. The pause that followed was stifling to say the least. There was no noise, other than the occasional feedback from the microphone system. Aizawa wondered if the kid might be unconscious and this was just his quirk doing all of the movement. From what the doctor explained, the quirk could be active even when the boy was not awake. While he didn't know if it could take over the boy during comatose, it wouldn't do any good to have something supposedly this dangerous able to control its user. Two weeks, a broken voice cracked on the other end barely audible to the three standing outside of the room. It sounded pained, but not physically. It was hard to describe, but Nezu did not relent. If it is all right, we would like to come in and speak to you about your situ. Don't come in, it wasn't loud, it wasn't commanding. However, it was desperate, soft, and obviously not comfortable. Aizawa watched the form in the corner shift once more, and he was concluding to himself just what, or who it most likely was. Please Midoriya Shonen. The principal tried. You will be completely safe. We just want to explain everything and ensure that you are okay regarding the situation. 
no harm will come to you or your quirk. Please, Aizawa, weighing his options on the situation, finally decided and sent the principal a look, who nodded. We're coming in. Okay. We will not harm you and nothing bad will happen. We are here to help you and protect you. You are a hero in the making, otherwise we would not have chosen you to be a student at UA. Before any response could come in from the other end, Aizawa walked closer to the door, taking his hand off the speaker system and placing it on the handle. He noticed how the doctor took. Cautious steps away, but did not stop. The principal slid down from his shoulder, leaving the homeroom teacher to complete the objective. With a click, the door opened, swinging the door forward with careful movements so as to not arouse any tension in the already distraught young man. Based on what he could deduce, Midoriya was unstable on a quirk level, psychologically, and emotionally. He was obviously in need of help, and unless it was given to him by a necessary force, he would never accept help or be able to garner any due to his lack of control and inability to hold back his own quirk manifestation. Before the door was halfway open, the slightest tick of noise caught his ears from the still dark room. He paused. He cast his eyes around the room from where he could see. He traced the forms of furniture and items strewn on the ground. No movement was able to be spotted, despite his methodological steps to watch for even the most minute changes. As his eyes made it halfway, he caught a slight shift, but it was too late. A mass of black, sharpened teeth, and white eyes flashed into his vision, aimed right for his head. He ducked back, and a flash of red making itself known in his eyes. Like that, the form of whatever that was dissipated into thin air. Aizawa pushed the door open the rest of the way, allowing dim lights from the outside corridor to pan into the room. He signaled for Nezu, giving the principal a signal not to turn on the lights. For all they knew, the boy was sensitive, and turning on the lights might force the quirk to try and activate again, even with Aizawa deactivating it. The room was barren. Only a bed, pushed against the far wall, a counter with several pieces of medical equipment on the floor near it, and various pieces of litter, most likely left over from the meals that they were feeding the boy. While it didn't look like a hospital room in any regard, it was clear that the doctors at the facility were more afraid of the boy than they were willing to help in his situation. He just wondered why nobody was called in to help with the situation, possibly a hero or officer to assist with the unstable quirk. He put it off to the side for now, narrowing down what he really came in for. Midoriya Izuku, he stated softly, walking over to a small bundle in the far corner of the room. Said form shifted deeper into the small space, but Aizawa did not relent, taking a few more steps towards the boy. I have deactivated your quirk. You are safe. He kneeled down lower, trying to find the boy's face. Nezu, seeing the positioning, pushed the door open just a tad bit more, allowing for light to hit against Aizawa as well as the young man huddled in the corner. As soft light hit against the figure of the boy, arms and legs shifted, tightening their hold over his knees and crunching in further. The scruffy teacher took another half step forward, still low to the ground. Young man. We're here to help, after all, isn't that what heroes do? That got the boy's attention, and for the first time since the whole encounter, he managed to catch a glance of the boy's eyes, which were a brilliant emerald green, trapped behind a dull shade of lifelessness. Aizawa leaned forward, isn't that why you became a hero? He asked softly, so you could help others. There was a pause. The small form of the young man immobile in its place. The tension grew for a few seconds, with the doctor and Nezu still just outside of the room, though the former taking steps to leave. Then there it was, the slightest nod came from the boy, who tucked back in on himself immediately after. Don't be afraid, Midoriya, your quirk cannot hurt you. Not when I'm here. He stated with soft confidence, hoping that the reason the boy was struggling was because of his fear of himself. Can he, dot you, Aizawa leaned forward, I couldn't catch that. The boy looked up once more with dull green eyes, he can hear you, he's saying, horrible stuff. Aizawa didn't show it, but he was surprised that the quirk was still active, even within the boy. It also meant that the quirk was able to communicate with Midoriya mentally. It could possibly explain why the boy was so terrified. Izuku was scared. The man had only looked at, dot him, and then he was gone. He felt all connection with the corporeal form disappear, and not a moment later he was screaming in his mind about the impossibility of what just occurred, how he was so close to eating the man. Izuku watched the man walk in the room, closer to him, 
speak to him. It was somewhat nice to have the man talking about helping him. He had never really gotten that before. Don't enjoy it for too long. Once I am able to take form again, he is mine. Izuku tensed up on himself, but then the answer struck him. He knew exactly who this was. There was only one hero who was able to deactivate quirks like that. And he taught at UA? Or was that a lie? Did they bring him in here to try and contain him? But then there was the principal. He pulled his eyes up ever so slightly, casting a glance past the pro hero. It was him. He was standing right there. Did that mean he had really gotten into UA? Even after losing control like he did during the exams? You can't lose what you never had. Midoriya, I am not lying to you. We're here from Ua to help you. You have gotten accepted, so now the only thing you need to do is come to the school and train to be a hero, that is, if you still want to. Izuku, despite his fear, despite his uncomfort and anxiety, untangled himself and flopped to the floor, pulling his eyes up to meet the scruffy looking hero. Please. He managed to gruff out softly, I, I want to be a hero. Aizawa looked down at the boy, who now revealed himself to him. He was thin, obviously not well fed based on the lack of definition where his collarbone was revealed under his hospital clothing. His arms were flimsy, and did not look as though they could even lift a few kilos. However, what caught his eyes were the shining layers of skin on his wrists and upper arms. Burn marks. And from the looks of them, not at all from two weeks ago, much older. The boy did not look impressive I aired to what he had witnessed him do to the zero point during the exams. However, it was obvious that the boy had some skill, otherwise he would not have made it through UA's exam in third place. Alright, then we are going to need you to come with us. Chapter 3. Negotiations Izuku was unsure of his situation. From what he had apparently been told, it had not been a few days since he was brought in. No, it had been weeks, weeks since the incident he rubbed his arm down the side the mismatched fabric wrapped around parts of his arms catching his cold fingers izuku had no idea that it had been so long to be quite honest he hadn't even thought about ua since it all happened he had been caught up or attempting to catch up with well everything his second voice in the back of his mind was muttering grunts of dissatisfaction plans to hurt the ua teacher as well as plans to have them escape now that they had no reason to be here anymore he pushed the voice back, instead trying to focus on where he was going and what was going to happen to him. If you allow me to, we could easily lay low for some time. I could hide us, maybe find us some food. Izuku's stomach grumbled at the prospect, but lightly shook his head. He did not see the eyes that caught the action. After we finish this, it would be wise to get yourself a proper meal. I'm sure that having a full stomach will help you, even if only a little bit. The green haired boy squeamishly pulled his eyes from downcast over to the principal of UA, who was now speaking to him. The principal of UA. Principal Nezu, one of the most intelligent quirk users in Japan, maybe even the world. And he was walking right next to him. He ducked his eyes away from the small authority figure, not wanting to place any ill will in his own direction. He doesn't look that powerful. The moment the black haired bastard looks away, I could easily take a bite out of him maybe both of them. Izuku shivered in on himself but continued walking forward, being led by the doctor. He did not know the man's name, but this man was the one who had apparently contained him in the hospital room he was now out of. He grumbled in the back of his head but Izuku was more interested in the fact that said doctor stopped. The jingling of metal, followed by the clicking of the door they were all in front of signaled the opening of their new room of travel. Please, step inside. The doctor stated flatly, to which Izuku took slow steps, trailing slightly behind the principal. He heard the steps behind him enter the room, confirming that Erasure Head was also in the room. The doctor bowed to the principal before walking out of the exit, closing the door behind him. Izuku finally took notice of the new surroundings. It was a small room, not too small, but it was clearly too small to be an office. More like a meeting room with four chairs in the middle and a small tea table sitting comfortably in the middle of all of it. It seemed the principal did not mind, who proceeded to walk over the set-up chairs and seat himself. He smiled at the green-haired boy, who managed to catch the action through his hair before looking back at the ground. Izuku felt a hand lightly touch his shoulder. His nerves went into overdrive, but unlike his usual occurrence, he did not feel his quirk stir under his skin. 
It's okay. Just sit down and we can begin. Izuku nodded, hearing the baritone voice behind him giving him much unease. He sat himself away from the other chairs, pulling it a bit of distance from the last three. Erasurehead did not sit, instead he stood next to the principal who continued to smile at the timid-looking boy. A small item was placed on the table, and with a quick glance, it appeared to be a packaged food item, like something that would come out of a vending machine. It was on his side of the table. Midoriya Izuku. There is much we need to discuss with you. Izuku nodded to the principal's statement, though he remained silent. While we will not divulge into anything you wish to say yourself, we have heard the basics of what has happened, Dot and we are sorry we were not there to help you. The principal stated in sadness, R. Job as teachers is important, but we are also tasked with being heroes, and the fact that such events occurred so chaotically is a failure on our part. W. Wait. Izuku felt words try to bubble out of his throat, but nothing would release. He felt constricted, like a snake was wrapped around his lungs and cutting him off. B. But. Dot not why your fault. D. Minus. Didn't know, he managed to get out, the voice in the back of his mind admonishing him for such a poor sentence. The principal raised his hand, paw, in pause. Be that as it may, heroes are tasked with protecting others, and it is clear that what happened could have been avoided had there been someone there to help. The principal sighed outward before continuing. But before we continue, I must ask, your admission to Ua? Do you still wish to attend? The principal began. Erasurehead went to speak, but was cut off. While it is understandable that you lack control, there is nothing that a bit of training cannot fix. Who does this guy think he is? I am not just some lowly quirk to be wielded like a tool. Izuku looked down at his hands. A bit of bandage still wrapped around his left hand's knuckles. He had Ru wrapped them himself a few days ago when he felt his injuries burning underneath and some medical ointment was available in the room he was in. Dropped by a nurse when they evacuated his room. Nobody had come in to fix him up, and he didn't want his quirk to heal him. I'm not your possession boy. I, I can't. Izuku felt himself break under his own words. His eyes felt heavy, his arms shaking, but he continued. I'll hurt someone, I, I don't want to H hurt anyone. Principal Nezu looked over his knees, looking at the very anxious child. Young Midoriya, there is no blame that should rest on your shoulders for what happened. Yes, we have heard what happened, but it was outside of your control. The boy looked up at him for a moment for the slightest moment before digging himself deeper into his seat. The principal thought for a moment before sighing outwardly. Midoriya, who do you think you hurt? The boy stared down at the tiled floor for a moment, his hands feeling awfully cold. I, I hurt those pee people. I in the apartment. He bit his lip, tears threatening to spill from his eyes. I, I, Tusan. He felt warmth run down his cheeks, but he couldn't stop them from pooling at the bottom of his chin, dripping to the floor. The principal looked up at Aizawa, who nodded, kneeling down a bit as to not make his presence too high on the obviously distraught young man. Midoriya. Did your father ever hurt you? That got the boy's attention, who spiked up from his seat, contemplated a series of actions before cringing in on himself and sitting back down. Aizawa did not deter, coming together with two and two. From the reports on Midoriya Hisashi, his quirk allowed him to breathe fire. It is labeled to be of low power, but even just small breaths can do more than enough damage to cause burns, much like the ones on the boy's arms. To be honest, he didn't like the lack of information on Midoriya. Hisashi's files. It felt barren compared to what a 37-year-old man should have listed regarding his history and background. No stable information about finances, no management or tax accounts on file. It was like it was not placed there with purpose, but that was for later, right now. He had a problem child to assist with. Midoriya, you don't have to say anything, but you have our words as heroes and as teachers that we will make sure you are protected. If you feel that you are dangerous, then we can help train your quirk. If you feel that you will be hurt, I will not lie, being a hero means putting yourself in harm's way to protect people. But if you wish to be a hero like you stated previously, then you must already understand that. Being a hero is no laughing matter, and there will be times to hard, or you can't win. You might want to run and hide away from the world, much like how you are right now, but this world is cruel, and it needs people to stand up for those less powerful. Heroes need to do such tasks. So if you really wish to be a hero, I need to hear you say it loud and clear, right now. 
The boy was breathing heavily, he had gone from soft breaths to heavy intakes of air as Aizawa continued his declaration. He was still looking towards the ground, but he took his feet out from under his knees once again, placing them firmly on the floor. His hands were clenched on his knees, but he tore his hands from the fabric, standing upright and pulling his eyes up to meet Aizawa, who stood up and leveled a look down at the smaller boy. He was still crying, his tears flowing down his cheeks, but there was determination and willpower. He shook in his spot before nodding vigorously. Hi, I want to be a hero. His hands were pulled up to chest level before he bowed lowly to the ground. Thank you, I think, I think I needed that. His confidence he had just moments ago drifted away, his voice growing quiet again, but still audible to the two teachers. Aizawa nodded down the boy before looking over at the mammalian principal, who clapped his hands together with cheer. The resounding noise spooked the child out of his stupor, red marring his face as he quickly sat back down, this time looking at the principal rather than downward. Excellent, young Midoriya. It's good you still have the drive to succeed, despite everything. However, there is still an important topic we have ghosted over. Your quirk. The principal said with a bit of concern. Your quirk is out of control, dangerous, and obviously violent towards. A sea of black pulled itself from the green-haired boy's chest, who tensed in on himself as the mass of his quirk took form. A hand of ebony slammed onto the coffee table, his white eyes finding their way to Eraserhead's own, glaring at the scruffy-looking man with fury. Who are you calling out of control? It demanded. I have perfect control. Calm yourself before I make you disappear like last time. Eraserhead threat seemed to hold some power, as the ebony mass flinched away from him growling at him as it receded to the boy's side said young man did not look the slightest bit happy about the situation curling on himself once more as the black hand brushed over his shoulder quit acting like a wuss you little jackass it demanded principal nezu looked at the two finding the relationship between quirk and user to be a bit lacking for his taste while this is a bit of strange timing i find that it is probably the best thing to do at the moment Three pairs of eyes were drawn to him, a small cheery smile donning his face. Yes, your relationship between yourself, young Midoriya, and your Kier. I don't belong to him. I'm my own presence, got it furball. Nezu decided to ignore its statement. The relationship needs work, so why don't you tell me, either of you, what you find lacking in the relationship, so that myself and Aizawa here can help find a compromise and make it more symbiotic. The mass of black, Sludge-like material seemed to look down at Midoriya, who flinched away from the look before it smiled and turned its attention back to the two. The boy never listens to me on anything, it said with sharpened teeth forming a grin. I might as. Well get everything I hate about this brat out in the open while I have the chance. Midoriya did not look confident enough to speak at the moment, which only spurred the mass to continue. It brought its hand up from the boy's shoulder, raising a finger. 1. The boy is a coward. Whether it was that blonde piss stain, those garbage bags that came in the hellhole, or your father, you never stood up for yourself. If you only asked, I would have gotten rid of them, no problem. There was a pause. Of course I would have eaten them, maybe not the blonde kid, just scare the shit out of him, but I would have been able to help, but no. The black mass seemed to form its face around, creating what? Looked like a copy of the boy's face, except it was still completely black its eyes looking haunting on such a young face. Oh no, it said dramatically. Don't hurt anyone, you might make them angry. Please don't hurt Toussaint. He just has a hard way of showing he cares. It morphed back to its original form, turning to the boy in the chair with a scowl. If I had any say in what happened, maybe you wouldn't have so many of those. Enough, Aizawa demanded with force, his eyes shining with a bit of red. Unless you wish to be reduced to nothingness, reduce your aggression. It backed off the boy, who curled in on himself more tightly as it moved away. It froze. Oi! Don't try pulling me back in. It'll hurt you more than it hurts me. Besides, I have more to say, damn it. It turned back to the teachers, holding two fingers up now. Aizawa was ready. In case it planned to harm any more. Two, he never lets me make any choices for us. While I might be my own, I'm stuck to him, so if he dies, I die. I want to make sure he lives probably more than he does for himself, but whenever I suggest anything, even in situations that would help him, he pushes me back. It's why I have to push my way through and take over occasionally. It turned to Midoriya, 
leveling a flat look at the boy, who managed to pull his eyes up towards the mess. I helped you survive with that sludge thing. I saved your ass more than a handful of times in the hellhole. I helped you get into that Ua school, and saved us too. Weeks ago, dot you still refuse. It huffed out, pulling up a third finger and looking down at Midoriya. 3. You never give me anything I want. I have needs too, I need food just like you, but whenever I crave something, you always say no, it picked up the packaged item on the table, eating it whole. Wrapper and all. There was a pause, signaling the two teachers that Midoriya was most likely speaking mentally with his quirk. Yeah, I'll give you that. Eating some people is not good, but not even those trashy asshats that push you around when your father invites them in. They are asking to be eaten, even if they smell. Horrible. I want food just like you. You don't get to choose every meal we eat. Anything you eat, I get a part of, and I'm tired of the same. Crap you seem to enjoy on a daily basis. I crave stuff other than rice, pork, and noodles. The ebony mass finally turned back to the two faculty members, pointing a finger at the young man he was attached to. I have loads of problems with the kid, but I'll put up with him if he makes agreements, and they better be good. The two teachers watched as the ebony mass floated down towards the shoulder of the young man, his black arm disappearing, with the front of his head now the only thing protruding from his host. The young man was riddled with shivers and anxiety his hands quivering against one another. The principal coughed into his hand, getting their attention. Now that we have heard your, his side of the story, Midoriya, please tell us what you have to say. Go on kid, spit out what you think you know. That did not seem to help the boy's confidence, but luckily he seemed to find some semblance of inner strength, a deep breath escaping the boy's lips. I, I don't l like it when why you eat people. The ebony figure remained still. I know you need energy but a eating people is wrong, even be bad people. The pause continued, with obvious speaking not able to be heard between the two adults in the room. I, I know, the boy didn't look particularly good, his face looking the slightest bit sick from. Whatever he could be thinking of. A and, when you talk to me, why you're, always so, well, h harsh. The black mass swiveled around to face the boy from the front, its white eyes staring in emerald green. I speak like this because I am built up from your emotions, your anger, your desire to fight back. If you carried yourself with more dignity, maybe I would you, boy. Midoriya looked up at the sea of ebony floating before him, sadness and betrayal marrying his features. Why you never told em me, any of this? The mass huffed, its teeth forming a frown. Would you have believed me? Do you even believe me? I can sense your mind. I know what you are always thinking. How do you think it makes me feel to be constantly weighing your trash in my own face? How much you fear me and refuse to work with me? And don't even bring up when I talk about eating you. You know as much as I do that if I were to actually eat your organs, I would die too. I say that to get you to shut up every once in a while so I can think. I'm constantly hearing your anxiety and it gets real annoying when I can't even process my own thoughts because some wuss is crying into my ear about, woe is me. Principal Nezu could tell that there was plenty of conflict between them, more than would be necessary for just one night of group therapy moderated by himself and Aizawa. The boy might just need professional help with his quirk, and not the kind that Ua normally offered. There were occasions that students dealt with internal problems. Doubt, guilt, mental trauma, personal affairs. They were not uncommon in a place where children had to grow up to be heroes that put their lives in danger for the sake of others, while Principal. Nezu hated that aspect that came out of Hero Academies, it was not something he tolerated happening under his nose when he could call for assistance. He would give the young man a chance for some time to fix himself, but if the situation arose where outside help was needed, he knew there were plenty of people he could call on. That, and he was sure that the quirk would not take too kindly to being subjugated to a shrink, as they put it. If all else failed, he would have to drop Midoriya from UA despite the fact the boy earned his spot. Hey Furball. Pulling his attention, he found the black mass settled on the young man's shoulder, but unlike when he first laid there, the boy did not look as tense. He looked uncomfortable with the predicament, but not to the point of a possible panic attack. I think I got a solution that me and the brat can lay on. He smiled at the black mass, nodding to the quirk who had more personality than half of working heroes. Well that's wonderful that you came up with a solution so quickly. Let's hear it. He looked over at Aizawa, who was clearly irritated about this whole endeavor taking so long. 
This whole thing was only to take possible a few hours, not the entirety of the night. He knew the scruffy man was scheduled to go on patrol tonight, Sunezu might just call in someone who could possibly fill in for him. He had taken away Aizawa's normal sleeping time which he did after classes ended, so it would be unfair to make him work what practically amounted to a triple shift. First, I promise not to eat anyone. It did not look very happy about the statement. That includes villains or even really horrible asshats. A and in exchange. The young man spoke up, not looking very gleeful about the situation himself. I, I'll promise to eat whatever he wants to eat. The boy shivered, which both teachers could deduce that the diet of the quirk was not a usual one. Question. Aizawa spoke up. Does this diet include anything that will make him sick or less fit for training? The quirk shook its head. No I simply wish to indulge in unique cuisine from time to time. He might be the one eating it, but I am the one who will be absorbing it as energy. That is why he is so thin. He eats enough for one, not two. Aizawa was very curious about how this quirk worked. Normally mutation emitter quirks such as this, with a sentient quirk, only required energy for the user, and if the user ran out of energy, then the quirk would as well. This was quite different, but then again, quirks were a constantly changing topic, with new and more unique abilities being found each year. I'm guessing he will need to eat what amounts to double portions to a normal student then, he asked, to which Midoriya jerked his head in a nod. The quirk seemed to laugh at the misfortune that dawned on the boy's face. Do be such a baby. You don't eat enough as it is, so this will finally get your body to stop being a twig. The stronger you are, the stronger I am. Aizawa nodded to the boy, who looked up at him with contemplation. It was after a few moments that he finally nodded his head in agreement. The principal nodded back. Ua's food court makes exceptions for students based on their quirks so there should not be much problems in that situation. As for your new lodging, we will brush across that in the very near future. But rest assured, your accommodations can be met. The quirk nodded. Next, he will take my suggestions, with no more pushing me back into his mind like usual. I feel constricted when thrown back, and it only pisses me off. Got it, brat? Midoriya looked up at the intimidating face with apprehension before finally nodding. And, you. You pee promise you won't try A and take over A and Y M more. If a mass of ebony sludge could look exasperated, then this one was succeeding in many regards. Sigh yes. But only if you agree to do things my way occasionally. If you don't and I have to save our asses, then I take over, get it? Aizawa decided to step in once more. Hold on. I don't want you taking over my student, even if you believe you are helping. If he is constantly having to worry about whether you will hijack control then he can never focus. It would ruin his potential. The quirk glared at Aizawa before huffing. Fine. I won't take you over, but you have to let me have some leeway in what happens. If you die, then I'm out too, and I'm not. Gonna die because you get reckless. Midoriya seemed to find this agreement more convincing, as he nodded to the black mass's face in response. Next, I want to be out like I am now. You don't try to block me like you did a few minutes ago. If I want to talk, then you let me talk. I'm not gonna be cooped up in your body while you get to have fun. Midoriya bit his lip. So long as you do not interrupt class, cheat during tests, or cause problems, you will be allowed access to speak. Principal Nezu stated. Aizawa looked over at the principal, thinking of his other students who might react. One student, Tokiyami Fumikage, had a quirk similar to Midoriya and his quirk was allowed to be out when they were not in the process of doing individual school work or when the room needed to be quiet. However, he was worried that the quirk might take advantage of the situation, but he could not be sure until he actually had a class with it. Oh yeah, Midoriya and this quirk were in class 1A. Great. Finally, in exchange for all of these agreements, I will relinquish some of my abilities to the brat, on the basis that I help him. Sorry boy but I don't trust you to use my skills when you only practiced when you were forced to. Midoriya tensed up on himself at the statement, which was almost not caught by the two teachers. Well, young Midoriya, from what we witnessed during your examinations, your quirk seemed to cover you completely about ten minutes into the exam. You destroyed a few bots before you finally attacked the zero point and protected another student. Principal. Nezu explained. Would you please explain that? Midoriya looked down at the floor, his toes tapping together, he didn't have shoes, another thing to get the boy. He was still in his medical clothes. 
his body hunched over itself, looking smaller once more to the two adults. W. Well, I. E. entered the exams, he began. I was, pretty slow, I couldn't keep up W with everyone else. T then pre sent Mike said T there was only five minutes L left, he pulled his feet up to his chest. Ignoring the disdain voice clobbering him in his head, I, I got scared, I D didn't get a S single point. That's where I come in. His quirk started with an evil looking grin on its large maw. He had a panic attack in the middle of the exam. A bot came right at him and took advantage of the situation. I smashed a few of those tin cans before I heard a voice call for help. Midoriya spiked up in his seat, to which the ebony face turned back to him. W when I heard, when I h heard that call for h help, t that was, real. The white eyes widened from its narrow look, a menacing looking smile now building on its teeth. Yes. I was actually going to leave her there. The idea sounded very fun, dot but then I heard you. Crying about helping her, wanting to save her. It was really annoying, so much so that I, well, I decided to help. The black mass looked smug, obviously pleased with itself about having a one up on its host, but Midoriya seemed to be looking at its quirk with a new lens. The air was tense between the two of them, even with the teachers right there. T thank you. The black mass's eyes widened ever so slightly at the words, but was cut off when a soft clap echoed in the room. While I would love to continue this, my young gentleman, there are more things that need to be done. People to see, and items to purchase, so why don't we get you out of those clothes and into something better, no? The principal stated with glee. Knowing the situation with these types of hospitals, we brought together a few things for you to wear. Unfortunately, we only have a pair of sandals in this haste, but we will remedy that tomorrow. The principal hopped up from its spot, gesturing for the two to follow him out of the room. Erasure head just behind them as Midoriya stood up from chair walking with slow steps out of the room with the black mass hanging on his shoulder. Aizawa looked down at the boy's side. You don't like being referred to as a quirk. He started, getting both its and Midoriya's attention. What should myself, others, and Midoriya refer to you as? It seemed to contemplate such a question. I've never thought about a name, I don't want something bland, nor something like a heroic gimmick that the brat would stick on me. It muttered to itself. There was a pause in its speaking as the four continued out of the hospital room. Just as they rounded the corner, making their way to the lobby receptionist, its eyes popped, a smile making its way to its face. I know. How about you call me, Doku? Chapter 4. Seeking Comfort. Aizawa Shoda didn't know why he agreed to all of this. His day was supposed to be just the same as any other in his current schedule. Go to school, possibly expel some students take a few naps during free periods, teach his class, and finally finish out the school day. Next he would go to the store because Hizashi forgot X or Y, or wanted A or B, leaving him to pick it up. He would get home, feed Miyagi, then sleep until his night shift began at 2200 where he would finish out, take a shower, then head to school to start if all again with a nutrient packet as his balanced breakfast. But no now he had a whole new addition to his ordeals. Instead of his sleeping and grocery shopping, he had to pick up a student who never showed up to class. Normally that constituted that they did not plan on attending Ua, but the principal made him go to the boy's home. That meant he had to call Hizashi to feed the cat after his radio show ended. It was not a huge change, but then things only grew worse from there. The boy's apartment complex was destroyed. No repairs had been made to it or been put to work upon it. The surrounding environment and its people, well, he understood why contractors would not want to be in the area. And the student, well, he was in a psychiatric ward for unstable quirk usage. That meant he had to call Hizashi again to make dinner without him, which he usually ate after he woke for his night shift. The boy had a plethora of problems, including a lack of self confidence, a painfully frail body composition, and a quirk that was as annoying as half of his class from last year. But the boy was hurt. It was clear that some of these problems, hell, most of these problems did not come from his quirk. B had burns that marred his arms and shoulders. He flinched away from contact, and couldn't even talk to his own quirk without looking as though he would fall into panic. He would put the boy into mental health before even thinking about signing him on for the hero course. But no, Nezu convinced the boy to still join the course, and while he would never admit it, the boy did seem to have some passion sparked in his eyes. His quirk, 
Doku also seemed to be on board, though he would have to watch that thing. He wasn't sure if it was completely safe. However, none of this was the blame of the brat. He was just a poor figure of unforeseen circumstances, and it was clear that something, someone was a contributor to not only his mental problems, but also to the physical damage that seemed to cover the boy. Aizawa watched how the boy pulled at his bland long sleeve shirt, covering his arms all the way to the base of his fingers. He wasn't going to mention how Izuku also had one exposed on his shoulder, which somewhat peeped through to his neck. It wasn't his place to ask anyway. He sighed outwardly as Nezu roped him into. He was not sure why he agreed to this, but he could see the explanation as to why Nezu asked him to do this. He just wished he didn't have to literally throw everything out of the window because some problem child had a series of unfortunate events. All right, Midoriya, come inside, he said flatly to the boy at his side. Said young man only continued to stare up at his apartment complex, his hands clenched at his sides. It wasn't too cold out, yet the boy was shivering. He leveled a look down at the child. Is there something wrong? He asked, to which he received a delayed jerk of a head. N no sir, um, Aizawa san, sensei. The boy stumbled over his words, to which Aizawa sighed outwardly once more before taking a few steps up to the front entrance of his living quarters. He turned back to the boy, gesturing for him to follow him up. The boy only continued to stand there, looking up at the building with heavy thought. That was until he looked as if he was kicked in the head and stumbled up the steps. Aizawa didn't hear it, but even he could tell that the Doku just told him to get moving. The young man followed him up the steps until they reached his apartment number. This whole apartment complex was protected. Pro heroes patrolled this area slightly more than average. Not enough to catch eyes, but enough to protect the heroes that lived in the complex. There were civilians who lived here as well, but the complex was known by hero. Communities to be a place of living for heroes who preferred not to live in overtly large homes, like Endeavor. With a swipe of his keycard, he pushed the door open. To Daima. He broke the silence lamely into his home. Though it wasn't real silence. There was never silence when Hizashi was home, as explained by the rock music currently playing on the living room speakers. Midoriya sheepishly followed behind him as he walked. Inside of his home, which had multiple voices calling into the air, though it was clear that some of these voices belonged to the song, and the loudest was coming from someone else. Midoriya Izuku never thought he would see this in his life. After all, most of his experiences before the last two weeks were not anything he was proud of, nor did he have anything he held onto from the past. Even so, he didn't expect to be pulled out of that hospital by none other than one of the smartest being in the world, Principal. Nezu of Ua, and at his side pro hero Ereshirhead. He never expected to be sleeping in the home of pro hero Ereshirhead for a night. He didn't expect to find some semblance of agreement with. I, Doku after so long. Watch it brat, I can still hear you. And he definitely didn't expect to walk in on pro hero and radio star present Mike standing on a couch, singing to American songs from years ago like his whole audience was watching him. Here we are now. Entertain us. I feel stupid and contagious. Here we are now, entertain Hey, Shota, your home, the May couch, landing in front of the black-haired man. With a smile brazen across his face, with a flick of his wrist, a controller was in his hands, the music off, and the entire situation ceased as if it never happened. The smile did not waver, even with the deadpanned expression that seemed to grow deeper on. Aizawa's face. I messaged you. You didn't respond. I was guessing it was because you were busy. Not doing, this. The man sighed, to which present Mike scoffed in mock agony. How dare you? This is me being busy, I have to keep up my voice or my fans will be disappointed. It took him a moment, but he finally seemed to notice the extra presences that seemed to be in the apartment. Who's the kid? Erasurehead only seemed to grow that much more irritated. I called you about it, and left a message. You haven't read or Listen to any of my notifications, have you? He asked with blunt seriousness. Present Mike's smile seemed to falter ever so slightly. Oh, how careless of me. I obviously didn't prepare anything like you asked. The man slumped against the couch, his normally gelled hair being out of its normal hairstyle, and instead dropping around his shoulders and against the side of the furniture's frame. No, it's not as though I set up the couch for the night like you told me to. Including quote, a few pillows and a blanket for the gaki, 
as he continued these actions, he allowed one of his hands to flutter into the air, waving around before pointing to the side of the said couch, where three pillows, a blanket, and a present Mike plush were laying together. On top of all of it was a toiletry kit and a set of clothing. No, I couldn't have possibly gone to the store and gotten those things that you asked for too, I obviously didn't put the cats in our room so they wouldn't bother our guest, I am such a busy person, dear me. Erasurehead put his hands up. All right, all right. Enough with the theatrix, I get it. I won't doubt you about those things again. Present Mike immediately forewent all of the whining, though both adults caught the sound of a snort, emanating from behind the scruffier of the two. Both turned to face the boy, who looked as though he was finding it hard not to laugh, however, when their eyes cast on him, he immediately straightened out, a tinge of red making its way to his cheeks. I sorry for laughing, he muttered softly, to which present Mike waved him off. It's okay kid, you'll find that Shota here can be quite the sourpuss when he hasn't had his sleep, the blonde man said with clear prods directed at the man who walked over to the kitchen, he seemed to look around for a minute before turning back to Mike, where is dinner, I can't find it. Second drawer down in the fridge, udon with chicken, arigato. Present Mike turned his attention from his roommate back to his new tenant, who didn't look entirely comfortable, he could probably help with that. He had read up on what Shota messaged him. He knew all about, at least the gist of it, what had happened and why the kid was staying with them. And if Present Mike wasn't going to be the greatest most bestest host ever, well, he would eat his own shades. So kid, what do you want to do? I know it's a lot to take in, but I'm here to help you if you need anything, nay? The boy took a moment before nodding. However, before Hisashi could say anything else, a mass of black protruded out of the boy's shoulder. The mass seemed to grow into that of a rounded head. With white, jagged eyes and a menacing smile of teeth building itself into its features before it smiled at the pro hero. It seemed to look side to side before nodding to itself. Nice place. Better than the hellhole. Whoa, in the surprise and the crazy appearance of what could only be described as nightmare fuel. Present Mike jumped back from the crazy looking face, his voice accidentally breaking in with his quirk, a small boom shaking through the apartment. Aizawa, having been reheating the food, jumped into action as the sound. As he turned around, he saw Hazashi on his back, the quirk hovering in the air, and the young man kneeling on the ground. What's going on? he demanded. Hazashi looked up at him with a bit of embarrassment before turning back to Midoriya, who was not looking so good. Midoriya, what's wrong loud pitch it was not the boy but rather the quirk on his shoulder who spoke out the black mass seemed to have broken down ever so slightly but was quick to repair itself and formed its face back to whole midoriya pulled himself up onto his feet though his movements were stifled and very rapid compared to his normally slow and tense actions doku turned to the erasure hero loud pitches and high frequencies due to our connection my form suffers physically, but because I'm a part of him, he feels the backlash. He turned back to the blonde with a glare in his white eyes, so no loud screaming. Present Mike nodded to the form before looking to the young man. Young Midoriya, he stated with full seriousness, I'm sorry if I hurt you, I did not know about such a predicament, and had I known, I would not have reacted the way I did. Midoriya shot his hands in front of himself rapidly. And no I it's okay why you don't have tea to apology apology accepted mr scream now wear some food i'm starving here midoriya bowed his head in shame to the two adults overwhelming tears threatening to fall i'm sorry about e everything p please do and not kick em me out i am most grateful for everything you have given me so far i do not w oi oi kid calm down aizawa said with irritation grabbing three bowls and placing them down on the table. It's fine. I told you that you should get something to eat, so the annoying Gaki on your shoulder is right. Said, Gaki, looked at him with murderous intent, but he remained unmoving from his spot on the boy's shoulder for a moment before sinking back under the boy's skin. Midoriya now stood alone, looking at the food from his spot across the room. Aizawa arched an eyebrow before sighing. You better eat it before it gets cold. The boy seemed to understand the statement after a few moments, as he cautiously made his way to the table, sitting down across from the teacher. Present Mike, who was now laying on the floor of the living room spread eagle, called out to them. Hey! 
After eating that, you guys want to play a board game? Erase your head huffed. You have 3A English homework to grade. Remember that, Mike. Which only seemed to pull a groan out from the other man across the room. Midoriya, who now found the confidence to eat his given meal, said his prayer and broke his chopsticks before he bit into his first bite of the reheated meal. As his mouth closed over the steaming food, his lips quivered as he chewed the soft noodles before swallowing down both the bite and his tears, which had been growing in his eyes. He continued to eat the meal with relative silence, managing to eat the whole bowl of noodles and offered chicken before he went to stand. Oi! Don't get up and leave yet! Aizawa stated as he cast a glance over to the boy in between bites of his own meal. After all, you have to eat for two. I put two bowls on your side of the table for a reason. Midoriya looked down at the bowl in surprise before turning his attention back to the pro. Aonyo, be but present am I. He already ate. That is all for you to eat, so I hope that you eat all of it. If you can't, don't make yourself sick, but try to eat as much as you can stomach. You need a larger appetite to feed two people after all. He stated knowingly before continuing his own meal. Izuku looked down at the bowl of food on his side of the small table before pulling himself back into seating. He looked at the food in front of him, his stomach already feeling a bit full, but he could not, no, would not refuse what they had made for him out of their hospitality. He picked up the bowl, taking slow bites into the meal as the two, three. If you count present Mike now grumbling in his bedroom about grating, sat in relative silence. Enjoy the meal for Toted to choose what we eat. Izuku grimaced at the possibilities, but somehow, it made the current meal that much better to enjoy. After all, it was the first time someone had cooked for him in years. Aizawa wanted to sleep. The idea of putting himself into his bed and passing out for the next period of time so he could wake up with a semblance of cognition was very tempting. Sleep was probably the best part of his day, as he often did not get enough of it. It was why he did so at school. But even then that wasn't enough. It was hard to get sufficient sleep when you had to focus on a class of rowdy students for one half of the day, then even rowdier villains in the night. Here are your things, sir. Have a wonderful day. He silently thanked the cashier of the till, grabbing up the items in the plastic bag and toting them out of the 24-hour store. Principal Nezu sent him a notification that all the boys' transactions regarding food, shelter, and any other necessary costs would be covered by Ua so long as he recorded the purchases and kept the digital receipts on file. While there was plenty of paperwork to go through for the school to make him a ward, Nezu was taking initiative to assist before it was even completed. The principal was quick like that, and he had no doubt that Ua would have the young man as a ward of protection within the next few days. It wasn't a common occurrence, but there were other students who have gone through situations that left them homeless or without care providers. The system to help these heroes of the future was created by Nezu years ago, and so far, it has helped over a dozen from Ua alone continue through high school until they are stable. Enough to provide for themselves with the careers they establish by being heroes. Aizawa looked down at his watch. It was near 0115, 1.15 am, meaning if he got on the next train, he could be home in time to get 5 hours. Not great but he could take a few naps during free periods and have energy to get ready for tomorrow's night duty. Can't believe the boss is dead. We'll have to do the run without him. Aizawa did not stop his movement as he passed the alleyway's opening, but he did make his steps that much softer than normal, the slight breeze having more effect on the noise than his own feet. He brought himself around the other side of the wall, leaning up against it to give himself the appearance of loitering. To think that little shithead killed him, he was supposed to be a part of the plan, and now not only is he gone, but so is his old man. Dragon said he had the brat under control. There were four of them, based on the voices, but there could be more. Aizawa couldn't arrest them, even if he wanted to, his. Witnessing of them planning a possible crime is not near enough for capture. You can't arrest someone for something they have yet to do, unless it was something more serious and he had evidence. Well, maybe we can find someone else pay a different shithead off to be our eyes and ears. We better make it quick. The guy's boss had connections to really wanted a mole, and now Dragon is out, and his kid. Aizawa raised an eyebrow. Dragon? He might be able to look into that, but a kid? Could they be talking about breaking into a youth center, or possibly a school? It wouldn't be the first time villains sent their kids into a school to be moles. Especially Ua. General and business course students were most suspect 
but it happened at times with the hero course too. It was rare for one to slip in, maybe one every few years, but they were usually caught within the first or second week of school, not that happened often. Surveillance was a constant watch at schools like. Ua. Aizawa pushed off the wall, not wanting to make himself out to be an enemy. It would be bad to get involved with a group of thugs, let alone ones with connections who didn't do a crime. As soon as they attempted anything, he could be on them, but until then, he would save this location on his phone and send notifications to the police about suspicious behavior in the area. The joys of bureaucracy. Tired and wanting his bed, Aizawa trekked into his home with quiet feet, placing the bag down softly at the edge of the couch. He looked over at the young man, who was currently soft asleep on the couch, clutching the present Mike plush close against his chest. He rolled his eyes. Hazashi would make a show of it if he saw Midoriya holding that so affectionately. He would just have to wake up before him and get Midoriya up before Mike could see it. He turned around, ready to get some sleep. The boy trusts you. Aizawa flipped around, his quirk ready within his eyes. As he turned to face the voice, he found the ebony mass floating above the boy's figure, looking right back at his red eyes with a menacing grimace. The young man shifted a bit in his sleep, but otherwise did not seem to notice. Doku, what is this? I don't trust you, erase your head. Doku whispered, placing its hands on the cushions and crawling over the couch, a tether still attached to the boy's shoulder. But now I have to deal with him that trusts. You. The words were harsh, but quiet enough to not awaken the boy. When he is asleep is the only time I have to myself in thought, it is also the perfect time to tell you how the situation is. Doku explained as it grew closer to Aizawa, who gave it a warning by flaring his eyes a little. Doku backed a little, but nonetheless continued slowly. The boy has always trusted too fast, even after everything. Even after I explained it to him, he still thinks you are there to help him, it said. With disgust, Aizawa leveled a glare at him. And why should that be a problem? I am here to help him, he stated with whispered full words. Then you better prove it. Too many have failed in that regard. Too many take advantage of him, and I won't have you be the next. If you so much as exploit or use him, I will make your life. A groan captured both of their attention. Breathing became more erratic, too. Which Aizawa, keeping attention on the quirk, walked over to the side of the couch. The boy was fitful his arms struggling against an invisible force. He was quivering, whimpering in fear of something. His head was shaking every which way. Aizawa took careful steps, walking over to the boy's side and ghosting his hand against the boy's. Midoriya, he stated with more volume. It's okay. There is nobody here to hurt you. His words were full of truth as he gently placed a hand on the young man's shoulder. The boy's fits slowed down, but they still remained. Aizawa waited until the boy's nightmare subsided, giving the boy his presence and holding onto his shoulder during the few minutes before he stood up from his crouched position, stretching his shoulders a bit before stepping back and away from Midoriya. Hum. Aizawa looked to his side, seeing the scrutinous gaze of the blast mass looking right at him. There was silence for a moment before it slowly slipped back, the sludge that seemed to create its form flowing back, as if it never existed under the clothing of the boy on the couch. Only his head remained, looking at Aizawa. I still don't trust you, and then it was gone, leaving the scruffy man to sigh to himself, looking at his phone for the time. Well, not as much sleep time as he was hoping, but he would take what he could get. Aizawa awoke to his alarm clock buzzing at him with impatience, as if it had grown lungs and was now yelling at him to get up to start the day. 6.30. He stared at the offending object with disdain. Wondering in times like these if he could have had a quirk that just deactivated things in general, it would make things easier. Groaning, he pulled himself to his feet, noticing that at least his joints didn't hurt as much as usual. Probably from actually getting some sleep on his bed and not on the floor. There was only so much cushion a sleeping bag could provide after all. He sighed, pressing his hand on the device before turning the infernal thing off, not wanting to hear it again in nine minutes. He felt around for his phone, of technology and sliding it into his sleeping pants pocket. He pulled himself up from his bed, walking over to his room's door and moving to open it softly. Hizashi might be up, but he didn't want to awaken the man by accident and give him a reason to be cranky today. Cranky Hizashi wasn't mean, just more snarky and overdramatic. It was worse than the Mike hero being angry. As he cracked the door open, 
Dim light poured into his room. The sounds of small dinks and the soft clattering of silverware became apparent. Hum. Well the man was awake, possibly making something for the kid. He made his way to the kitchen, rubbing his eyes from the irritation of overuse. Hazashi, don't forget to make an extra portion for the ga, ki. Aizawa stared with a deadpan expression marrying his features. It quickly turned into a bit of surprise, his eyes still adjusting to the dimmed kitchen lights now having more access to his vision as he stared at the person in the room. Midoriya was at the burner, the sizzling of fish and a spatula being in the young man's hand. It was as if the boy was frozen, but then he quickly turned away from the pro hero, flipping the fish on the pan and allowing the other side to cook. Go Goman, Aizawa S. Sensei. The boy stuttered out. I, I didn't know if you wanted Emmy to make B breakfast. Aizawa shook away his tiredness, going over to the young man with careful steps, as to not set him off. The boy flinched away ever so slightly, as if it flowed into his movements, but Aizawa caught it. He looked over the assortment. The boy had all the regular sides and main dishes, steamed rice, grilled fish, edamame, and miso soup. There were also sliced veggies, something that Aizawa didn't even think they had in the fridge. He looked over at the young man, who was still shakily flipping over the last pieces of fish. Midoriya, you didn't have to cook for us, he said as authoritatively as he could muster. The boy sunk on himself, turning to look at the man with a hint of confusion. Demo, dot the note said, Aizawa. Internally smacked himself in the head. Currently on the counter was a note that stated in blunt wording, if you wake up before I do, don't forget to make four portions. Of course Midoriya would get up before Hizashi and read that. He leveled a look at the young man, flicking off the burner on the stovetop before kneeling down. Midoriya. It's our job to help you, to provide. You don't need to make us breakfast, and that note wasn't meant for you. Understood? The boy's shoulders were at his ears as he nodded shakily. But, the boy looked up at him as he stood up on both feet. It looks good. Thank you for the meal. The boy was obviously a bit. Overwhelmed by the statement, freezing up on himself, Aizawa stood there awkwardly as the boy seemed to go through a plethora of emotions. He wasn't used to this kind of stuff. What now? Yo! What smells awesome? Aizawa silently thanked the fact that Hizashi slid into the kitchen in his socks. Wow! Kid! You made all this? The young man, who finally was pulled from his little internal debates, probably with his quirk as well, nodded rapidly. Hizashi smiled. Thank you for the food, little rock star. Midoriya turned red. From the praise, and Aizawa sighed. Leave it to Hizashi to diffuse the tension in any level of awkwardness. Can you please stop playing around and just eat? The mass of black formed on the boy's shoulder, picking up the three plates and dividing up the food, one obviously getting more. Midoriya watched in fear as his quirk did so, his eyes drawing up to the two adults in the room. Aizawa gave him a look and waved his hand. You're fine kid. That's why the note said four portions. Double for your key, Doku. He stated, ignoring the frown that began to build on the face of the black mass. Doku turned to the boy, placing a clawed hand on his head and ruffling his hair. Midoriya flinched. See kid, I told you it was for us. Like I said, listen to me more often, now eat up. Izuku nodded to the quirk dragging his plate over to the table. Hizashi and Aizawa did the same, collecting the extra assorted items onto their plates before joining the unusual young man, who was eating his food with an intense level of politeness and haste. It was clear the boy still had many problems, but hopefully whatever Nezu had planned for the day would make things better. Chapter 5 He was nervous. His uniform felt uncomfortable against his skin, despite the high quality of the material. His tie pressed tight around his neck, as though a noose was prepped to finish him off. His hands felt sticky, the motions of clasping and unclasping his fingers not helping much with the problem as he attempted to keep his mind at ease, he was failing miserably. Oi, Brad. Will you relax? Despite the bite in the deathly quiet words, the ball in the center of his stomach loosened ever so slightly. An occasional bump in the road made him bounce ever so slightly as he rode in the back seat of the vehicle. Both Eraserhi Aizawa Sensei and Yamada Sensei were in the front seat, the former casting an occasional glance back in his direction, offering platitudes and asking the young man if he was okay. Izuku said yes every time, even as his tension rose. His legs vibrated, 
his hands moving to grip the material of his new pants. As much as he didn't want to wrinkle them before his first day, he couldn't help it as his nails painfully dug into the top of his thigh. His eyes darted towards the red shoes that Aizawa Sensei had purchased for him, the shine of the morning light catching the glaring color. He looked away, trying to let the newfound guilt dissipate. Don't make me come out. Fucking relax. I can't enjoy my leisure time with your dread filling up the whole of your mind, damn it. Izuku nodded in a flinch, taking in a deep breath to calm himself and to try to stop his heart from beating out his chest. A pair of eyes cast back in his direction, and Izuku straightened in his seat at the lazy glare from the man in the passenger's seat. We'll be there in a few minutes. Try not to throw up in the back of Hizashi's car. Hey now. You really car that much about the interior? I'm shocked. No I just understand that if the gaki does throw up on your leather, you'll complain for the next week about it. Izuku couldn't help but smile a tiny bit at the dramatic antics that followed from the more flamboyant pro hero. Aizawa sensei was quick to rebuke any loud statements made by the driver of the car, who continued all the way until they reached the parking zone just outside of the school. It also helped that while crass, Doku was making a few inappropriate comments about the two that Izuku managed to find humorous. By the time they made it to Ua, Izuku felt that ball of dread wither bit by bit. It was back, and it was much bigger now than it was earlier. Yamada sensei made his way towards the English classrooms, as he apparently had some work to finish, which Aizawa sensei said he should have completed last night instead of playing with the cats. Now, it was just Izuku and the dark haired teacher, both of which walking along the upper levels of Ua, the school's walls obscuring. The rise of the sun, which had only just made its way to the edge of the horizon. Midoriya, before we instate you in classes for today and here on out, one more official meeting must be made between yourself and Principal Nezu. Aizawa sensei stated as he walked beside the boy, who looked around nervously at the inner parts of the school's building out of wonder and amazement. Izuku looked to the wall of windows at his side, gazing upon the city below and the rest of the visible campus. He slowed his steps, finding himself lost in the situation, and where he truly was. I, I'm in Ua. I walked through the gates, and up the steps. I went up the elevators, and am not standing on the top floor of Japan's more prestigious hero academy. He felt his eyes betray him, as tears began to well up. He sucked in a breath, trying to gain control of his unsteady emotions. I made it. I, I'm really in Ua. At it, out his shoulder formed a mass of black, the alignment of teeth speaking before the eyes were even fully formed. You're in the shit school, no thanks to anything you did. Get your ass in gear and finish this idiotic meeting so we can just get on with your garbage life. The white of its massive eyes glared at the boy, who cowered but nonetheless nodded and quickly stumbled back alongside the pro hero, who has slowed himself in weight of his student. Aizawa narrowed his eyes at the mass of black mire, who had the audacity to smile toothily at the man as they continued forward. Rounding a corner, they found themselves at the front of an impressive large door. Moving forward, Izuku watched as Aizawa sensei didn't even have the chance to knock before the door cracked open, the diminutive principal opening it and smiling up at the two figures. Ah, you're here. He said brightly, while I am quite glad you came so early, I had been hoping to grab some more water for my teapot before we began. However, I can relent on such a matter for a few moments while we discuss everything. Please, come in. Principal. Waved his hand, beckoning in the two other men, boys into his office. As they entered, Izuku allowed his eyes to wander for a few moments before he moved to place himself in the seat across from the white furred mammal. The large windows behind the principal showed an expanse of the city behind him, where the sun was still shining over the tips of few buildings. Doku swung around from Izuku's shoulder, grinning at the interior of the room. Nice place you got here. Better than that other school's dump of an office. Riddled with steaming piles of shit knick knacks and worthless paper achievements on the walls. The black being's teeth rose up into a much larger smile. All I would need is food and I could call this a fun little home base. Nezu's eyes crinkled into up as he smiled at the quirk embodiment. I apologize, but only tea comes into this office. Food can be a bit of a mess. Says the furball. I wonder how often you have to vacuum hair off these chairs and floors. Less often than you think. I don't shed frequently, and my clothes help during the winter months. Nezu placed his hands on his desk. But as much as I would like to continue this train of conversation, 
That is not why we are here today, is it? Izuku shook his head, pressing his hands against his pant legs and trying to make himself as small as he could, relative to the black mass currently residing on his shoulder. Nezu looked upon the young man, noting a few differences from today compared to the night prior. Midoriya was still reclusive, timid, and in need of mental help, but overall, there was more livelihood to him now, coupled with the fact that his quirk was not attempting to do anything damaging, yet at least. His black beady eyes coasted to the back of the room, where Aizawa looked to him, nodding before shutting the door and closing access to the room. Putting his hands, paws, onto the thick, elegant wood of his desk, Nezu looked across at the boy, who fidgeted at the gaze. The quirk did little, other than give him a sinister looking smile, which he returned with less aggression. I understand classes begin in less than an hour for the day, and much paperwork would need to be done based on the results of his discussion, so let us move along quickly. Pulling out a set of documents from the drawer at his side, Nezu drew the three other presences towards said folder. Midoriya, you will have three choices regarding your future. The answer to said choices will affect not only your life while in Ua, but possibly some of the staff as well. Nezu watched the boy cringe on himself. Relax, young Midoriya. Nothing that will happen to you will cause harm, and my faculty will uphold the duties I assign to them, so do not feel in any way guilty for the actions you partake at the moment. The boy's tense shoulders loosened slightly, but it was clear he still wasn't comfortable having such a task. Izuku was nervous. What did Nezu mean by his actions would affect the faculty of Ua? Were they going to have to watch him? Maybe they didn't trust him? It would only make sense considering everything. Remember well, Izuku. You're our ticket in. If you blow this, I'll make sure you regret it. Besides, you wouldn't want to disappoint your dear old dad, would ya? Izuku shook away the memories, not wanting to hang up on had happened. He didn't want to remember. Stop worrying brat. That shit stain can't touch you. He probably ran away and is still licking his wounds from the total beatdown I gave him. But, what if he is still looking for me? What if he's angry? Now, Izuku felt Doku shift on his shoulder, both him and the black mass looking to the principal across the ways from him at the desk. Your first option is simple. You would be placed within a special location here at UA. Due to our security, we always have at least one or two pro heroes in the vicinity, and several guards roam the walls, so you would not need to worry about your safety. Cementos would be able to construct a location for you with about a week's time. Your status as a ward would allow you refuge at the campus, but you would also be required to be under watch of a pro hero, mainly for your own protection. Izuku nodded. He was used to living on his own. Back in the apartment, he would go weeks without seeing anyone, mainly because of how long his father worked. Option 2. Principal Nezu held up two fingers with a smile. You would join our current student residency building. We have several students currently living here be it from their out-of-country attendance, their own status as wards, or that they be related to any heroes that may be working within Ua. It is not a large facility, due to us only ever having a few students using it at one time. You would board with currently three other students, two of which are first years, and another second year. That being said, you and Doku. Would, what are their quirks, D. Doku? Izuku asked in shock, horrified at the masses gall to interrupt the principal mid-speaking. What, I have to ask, because you won't? Doku shifted forward through the air, leering over the desk now. What can they do? These other asses you have in the building. Nezu didn't seem too perturbed by the breach of his personal space or being cut off. He opened a folder, as is prepared for the question and pointed down at the three pictures. This young female has horns on her head which she can launch like projectiles, the young man has the ability to produce scales on his skin and our second year can produce kinetic flames from his. I'll pass on the second option then. The mass shifted back closer towards his host, who looked petrified in his seat. Doku looked at Izuku, who craned his head slowly to gaze into the sea of white. Before you start blabbering or talking in your head, I've had enough fire being thrown my way to be fucking tired of it. I'm not living with another bastard who can use it, so sue me. Izuku felt like he wanted to die. He turned his head to Nezu then back to Doku, trying to find his words. Finding his control for a moment, he simply flailed his arms in front of himself, looking to the other side of the desk with guilt. PR Principal N. Nezu. F. Forgive D. Doku. H. E. Doesn't M. Mean to turn down why you're generous. Yes I do. 
The mass wretched its head into Izuku's vision, who cowered away at the very direct move. Remember our agreement? I get to make choices for us too, so if I say I ain't living with no fire user, I won't. Izuku felt himself tear up, but before he could spill any more words from his throat, the mass of black disappeared, fading to nothingness. I told you to not be so aggressive yesterday. I'll do that again unless you act civil in front of the principal. Izuku turned around, seeing the tired, glaring red eyes of Eraserhead looking down upon him from above his chair. It seemed he had remembered that Doku could hear him through Izuku, as the young man's mind was suddenly filled with curses and said at a certain underground hero. Izuku watched as Eraserhead's hair drooped back down across his head and face, the red draining away from his gaze. The mass of black pulled itself from a shoulder, glaring at the scruffy man, his teeth pulled into a snarl. Quit doing that, damn it. I'll stop when you behave, problem child. I'm not a problem child. Izuku swore he heard the tantrum in. Doku's voice, but said nothing. Only a hint of amusement dragging itself into the forefront of his mind as he imagined Doku throwing a child fit. The mass of black twisted around, glaring lightly at Izuku for his thought process. Izuku sucked in a breath, casting his eyes down and was quick to think of something different not wanting the ire of Doku focused on him. Gentlemen. I believe we still have one more option to cover. Nezu brought the attention back upon himself, holding up three fingers now. Let us keep all questions or interruptions for the end, gentlemen. I'm sure it would be best considering the situation. Izuku nodded, but noticed the apprehension currently weighing on his shoulder. He looked to Doku with pleading eyes, who glared back. With white indifference. After a few moments held like this, the white eyes rolled around on the black expanse, shooting back towards the direction of the principal. Nezu smiled, nodding to himself as he opened another folder. Lastly, another solution that we hold would be to have you under the direct supervision of a pro hero. One that attends Ua. Nezu entangles his fingers together, eyes looking over the the scruffy man stand a few feet away from the green-haired boy. Aizawa's eyes gauge open and Nezu knows that his favorite homeroom teacher understands. We have several teachers that live close to UA's campus, and their ability of attending the school gives a solution to transportation and security, however, said chosen faculty member. Would have to give their consent of you lodging with them. Nezu clasped the folder shut. Those are the options. I will now give you time to weigh the benefits and constraints of such a decision. Izuku nodded nervously his mind ablaze with the information as he began to go over his choices. Well, the first option doesn't seem so bad. I would be on my own, living in a little house location on campus. I don't know if they provide food, or if I need to do something extra to cover those costs. Oi, we would also be under constant watch. Whether it's from cameras of a shitty hero, as much as I like being on my own, I get annoyed having to only listen to your prepubescent voice. Izuku couldn't help but concede that point. Doku made a fair argument about that. He himself often had a hard time falling asleep when he was being watched. Whether it was when one of dad's friends, or from the cameras in the hospital room, he didn't feel comfortable with eyes on him. Oh okay then, how about the second Choi, no way. I am not living with a fire breather. B but they might be nice, T they are part of the hero course. Oh yeah, like how one of your garbage bag of a father's pals was, nice to you, then he. P please do don't bring him up. Okay. Not hearing any statement of refute, Izuku felt safe enough to continue. But living with O other people wouldn't be that be bad. Hmm, I still don't want to live with other brats. I personally like the last one. Why you like the last CH choice? I thought you said you didn't want to be watched by AH hero? I don't but it's going to happen. Might as well get to choose who it is. Plus, we get to live with someone, and they would have food. Just as long as they don't burn stuff or yell in my ear, I don't give two fucks. B but then they would have to watch us, I don't want to cause more work for them. Let me put it to you like this brat. If we live with them, or if we sleep away from them, a pro hero is going to be watching us or be near us. It makes no fucking difference what you choose, one or three, a pro is going to be next to you. Izuku felt his mouth go ajar surprised by the logic of the statement, and nodded his head. Thinking over everything as Doku patted himself on the back mentally, Izuku pulled his attention back towards the two adults, who were now standing next to each other. I, I would like option 3. 
as long as I'm not a burden to the pro hero that would be watching me. He scrambled out, his face going red at the too quick of words. Regardless, the principal smiled, nodding his head and placing the folder back within his desk. Wonderful, I will look into which hero would be most suited for such a task, and you will move in with them by the end of next week. Is that appropriate for you, young Midoriya? The boy hesitantly nodded. I, I just don't want to make them feel angry for having to watch me, he whispered out. Gaki. Izuku heard the gravely voice of Eraserhead. Whatever poor sucker is gonna be stuck with you will deal with it. They made agreements to help students no matter what happens, be it life or death situations or something as mundane as bunking with a teenage problem child. Don't overthink this stuff. Izuku looked up at the pro hero with surprise. Besides, I'm still stuck with you until a place has been set up for you. Nezu has already made the arrangements, so long as you are comfortable with my couch for a few more days. Izuku looked at the man like he had just told him he was buying him the world. Pulling himself from the chair, he flopped to the ground, placing himself in a floored bow. Despite the loud complaining happening from his shoulder, he still brought his hands down at the end of the desk, aimed at the scruffy looking man. Thank you so much, Eraserhead. I am grateful for all you have done for me. Please take care of me, he felt his eyes sting with tears. Kid, call me Aizawa, or Aizawa sensei in class, just pulled yourself off the ground. No need for the waterworks or the praise. Izuku nodded, wiping his eyes with his sleeve as he dragged himself off the ground. Jeez brat, man gives you a couch and you treat him like God, I save your ass and get you into this fancy school and what? Nothing but crying all the way home that day. Fucking hero bias. Despite his outward anger, Doku looked at the boy he was attached to, noting how happy he seemed for the moment. Keeping face, he rolled his eyes, glaring at the underground hero as he retreated into Izuku. Doku would let the kid have this too, he supposed. A pair of paws clapped together. Wonderful that would come to an agreement. Principal Nezu jumped down from his seat, rounding his desk and walking over to the shaky young man. There is still paperwork to complete now that everything is decided, but for now, we have laid out the plans for the future. I'd say that's worth a cup of tea. Aizawa sighed behind the kid, stepping forward before the principal made his way out, as much as I would like to wrap this up. We still have a few things to cover. Counseling, and the test. Tea test. Izuku blurted out, darting around to look at the teacher behind him. IIH haven't had any books A at use. W will I have time to study? He pleaded, to which he received a shake of the head in denial. A mass pulled itself out from the distraught child. And what is this about counseling? I am not going to be under the eyes of some damned shrink. Calm down, problem children. The scruffy man drawled out, ignoring the meep and the howl of frustration from the duo. The counseling will be required by me. Until it is determined that you are healthy, I put in a mandate as your homeroom teacher. Normally I wouldn't have the ability to do this but due to your status as a ward, and my hero license, I can dictate a few things to make sure you develop properly at this school. Neither looked very happy about the statement, but said nothing yet, thought it looked as though they wanted to, Hound Dog is specialized in health, psychiatry, and youth mental psychology. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're not fine. It's not your fault, but I'm not going to let you waltz around waiting to be broken. It would ruin any P. He made his tone of voice clear with a, no negotiations, attitude. Doku growled at him from the boy's shoulder, who looked down at the ground, his hair rolling over his eyes. Aizawa sighed. Don't think of it as a punishment. Think of it as someone wanting to help you for your own sake. Like I said, why do we need some shrink? Me and the brat are fine. We don't need you clowns poking into our lives. Your lives are now a part of our lives. Besides, this isn't even for you. Counseling is mainly for Midoriya. Despite how you hate it, you are his quirk, so you don't have much of a say in this. Don't go trying to convince the kid to not go. I'll know immediately. Aizawa turned his attention to the boy. Midoriya, we are doing these things to aid you, so is your teacher, I trust that you will go to the signed off times. There was a pause, and Aizawa watched the silent interaction occur between the two. It was interesting, as neither moved much only making slight movements based on what the other could be saying. Nezu stood by a few yards away, obviously more focused on his new pet project than that of a hot cup of dried leaves. Aizawa was patient, 
waiting with his arms crossed for a few more moments before the boy finally jolted, looking back up at him. I, I'll go. Midoriya stuttered out, fear in his words but nonetheless speaking, the mass of ebony at his side looking frustrated. Aizawa nodded, satisfied with the lack of confrontation that he feared would happen if his quirk won the argument. This proved that the problem child was getting better about holding his own within his mind. A Anyo, but what about T the test? Aizawa smiled, and the fear returned to Midoriya's face. Izuku shifted his hands on his bag. He was a ball of nerves, following behind his teacher as to not lose sight of him. He hadn't had much time to explore the school, so Aizawa's sensei was his only means of getting to the classroom. Izuku didn't know how to feel. On one hand, he felt nothing but joy. He was in the school he had been looking forward to since he was four. He would get to be in class with other hero students, and would be allowed to train and learn with some of the best in the hero world. Izuku also didn't have to do any of those things his father wanted him to do. But just in case, he would take notes should he ever get the call. That was the part he was scared of. He was a ward of the school now, which confused him. Maybe it was because his dad never came to pick him up, or it was just a policy that happened due to his situation when he was in that hospital. What if, what if they found out who dad was? Fear clenched at his chest. If they knew, then why would they have even let him in? Maybe there was something he was missing? Izuku only hoped that if things went bad, he could give dad and his friends a reason not to be angry. After the beating I gave that piss stain, I doubt he'll want to come around and attack again. B but what about his friends? W won't they be upset about me betraying them? We'll burn that bridge when we get to it. Despite the venom in the words, they made an effect on Izuku's sense of relief, rounding a corner behind his teacher. Walking along the hallway, his green eyes looked up and widened. Not a few yards. Down the path was a sign sticking out above a very large door, the white letter and number emblazoned on a red sign. 1A, so, is it everything you thought it would be? Ciro nudged the redhead to his side, who gave a toothy smile back. Heck yeah. He pumped his fist into the air, drawing the attention of several other students within the classroom. It's still school, but we get to learn under pro heroes, and yesterday's assessment showed me just how awesome and manly this school can be. Hiroshima. I ask that you not make such a large amount of noise. Class will begin momentarily, as is customary by the time schedule for when Aizawa sensei enters the class. But, you're being louder than I am, Iida. Hiroshima pointed out, much to the horror of the blue haired boy. Shoot. Iida flopped over in his desk, the girl at behind him patting his back in an attempt to help high now sour mood. It is crazy though. A girl with earjack earlobes couldn't help but bring up. I mean, we had 19 students yesterday, and now we have. 18. I wonder if they'll get rid of more of us, she surmised. It simply proves how difficult this school can be, and how the standards are to be weighed heavily for our futures. A muscular young man with multiple arms justified. The door cracked open smoothly, and those who were still not sat moved quickly to slid into their seats, not wanting to risk anything. Everyone planted their hands on their desks, some crossing, some fingers intertwined, and others doing so out of habit. Many eyes darted to the now agape entrance, where their scruffy looking homeroom teacher stood, almost slouched over himself. Good morning, Aizawa sensei, good morning class, he stated back evenly, trudging towards his own stand at the front of the room. However, before he could make it all the way, he turned back, making a motion with his hand towards the door. Several students craned their necks, curious of the action as they looked to the still open door. Not a few seconds later, a red sneaker stepped in. A head of curly green hair bounced ever so slightly as the rest of his body shakily trailed in. Freckles dusted his cheeks, his green eyes flashing over the class in clear nervousness. He didn't look like much, with his figure not appearing overly muscular, and his height being a little less than average. He was plain. He looked like a terrified rabbit, slowly stepping his way into the room. A pair of red eyes immediately recognized the person who had the decency to look his direction for half a second before flinching away. What the fuck is he doing here? Everyone, this is your classmate. Several students looked shocked at the statement. He was unable to attend class yesterday, but is here now. Midoriya, your seat is just behind Bakugo, the boy with blonde hair at the right corner of the room. Go sit down. The green-haired boy, Midoriya nodded, moving stiffly towards his chair. 
As he did so, trying his best to ignore the stares, Aizawa moved behind his stand and began addressing the class as a whole. Izuku managed to ignore the glare of red pointed in his direction, barely able to get into his seat and shakily grab out a notebook to begin the day. Aizawa sensei continued speaking, helping to take away some of the attention on him. He took in a breath, doing his best to stay focused and not overreact to who was sitting right in front of him. He was in Ua after all, so even if Kachan was in his class, it wouldn't be horrible, right? Maybe if you let me eat him, it would solve the problem. US said you wouldn't eat any, I know, I know, geez, take a joke, damn it. Izuku felt a nudge at his side. His shoulders tensed, but he quickly controlled his movement. Looking down, he saw a small piece of paper sitting on his pant leg. Despite his past problems with notes sent his way, his interest got the better of him, and he took up the paper. Flipping it open, scraggly kanji were written out on the paper. Hey, welcome to the class Siro looking to his right, he found an awkward smile sent his way by the black-haired boy sitting right next to him. Too shocked to say anything, he gave a small anxious smile back, tucking the note away into his backpack. Yeah, maybe Ua won't be so bad, whatever you say, brat. Chapter 6. New experience, all right, homeroom is dismissed. Your next class will begin in five minutes. Aizawa sensei was quick to slide on a familiar piece of yellow sleeping wear, the zipper being slid upwards and sealing his body. He fell to the floor, and began to practically slither out the door. Don't forget, you have hero training at the middle of the day, so be prepared. He gave his students a look of tired contempt out of nowhere before flipping around moving to the door with astonishing efficiency. With those final words, the door opened up and he was a group of confused students. Man. A blonde with a black lightning bolt in his hair leaned back into his chair. I don't think I'll ever understand our homeroom teacher. To which the girl beside him nodded. Yeah, but at least he's not boring like the teachers back in middle school. She swung about what appeared to be an earlobe in a loop, looking at the board with a hint of carelessness in her words. Izuku put away his notebook, sliding the object into the bag generously donated by Aizawa sensei. It wasn't anything fancy, but at least he would be able to store his books in it for school. Pulling out another folder, he opened it up, seeing the schedule for his classes inside and noting that the next class was with present Mike, or Yamada sensei, for English studies, then math with ectoplasm. That's so cool. Hey. Izuku flinched at the loud words but then relaxed himself to the best and turned to his side. A pair of grinning black eyes looked in his direction, a hand casually waving back and forth. It was the black-haired boy that sat next to him, Siro. Nice to meet ya. Didn't really catch your name by the way. Izuku blushed at the attention, ducking his head away while thinking of a quiet response. Didn't you hear sensei? The redhead just a seat over called out, getting the other boy's attention. His name is Midoriya or something, right? This time, the question was directed at Izuku, who couldn't find the power to speak, rubbing the back of his apprehensively. You um, hi. The redhead grinned, his shark-like teeth poking out from his mouth. Nice to meet you man, name's Kirishima, and welcome to 1A. Izuku nodded, the energy absolutely infectious from the red-haired teen. Gotta ask, what happened yesterday? Is there a reason you weren't in class or something? Izuku felt his mouth fill with cotton once more, but it wasn't him that had the chance to speak. A mass of black pulled from his shoulder, grinning at both boys. None of your business, piss heads. Izuku stared in shock at the forward and cruel words. He frantically waved his hands in front of himself and the ebony ma, trying to detract away from the other being. D Doku, D don't be so mean, he pleaded. Izuku shifted around. Looking to the two boys who were actually being nice to someone like him. I'm so sorry about him, he didn't mean anything by it, Izuku apologized profusely to the wide-eyed teens sitting in the chairs beside him. Not that he noticed, but the outburst had gotten much attention pulled over to Izuku, eyes peering to the side of the class where there was now a strange black mouth of sharp teeth hanging in the air, distilled evenly over the shoulder of the newest student. A pair of eyes flared up at the sight. Whoa! Kirishima leaned back into his chair, pulling himself from his seat and staring up at the strange thing hanging off the new kid. What is that? Your quirk? That's so cool. Izuku looked away in shame. Doku, noticing the amount of attention he was receiving, decided to capitalize on it. 
Coming from someone that looks like a red brick, that's not much of a compliment. He smirked at the redhead, swinging his body around to look at the class. And the rest of y'all, don't go poking your business into mine. Geez, the new guy is gonna be a pain, isn't he? A girl with earlobe jacks said tiredly, swinging them around in attempt to ignore the commotion. It's like having two loud and annoying Bakugos. The hell? I'm not like that piece of fucking trash. The quirk and the mass turned in unison to one another. Got something to say, asshat? The class seemed to find the joint speaking between the black mass and the blonde bomb user amusing, judging by the laughter then echoed through the walls from seeing the two butt heads so ferociously. It had only been a minute since Sensei left too. The green haired boy felt like crying all over again. I'm very sorry, everyone, Izuku blurted out, bowing lowly to the classmates who were looking upon the debacle. I can't really tell him what to do. Damn straight, brat. Please forgive his actions, he's just not good at giving compliments. I don't give any. None of these shit stains deserve M. It is really nice to meet you all. My name is Midoriya Izuku, and this is Doku. Please take care of me. Izuku felt that as he bowed any lower, his back would give out. He didn't want to stand up to full too soon, however, terrified of the looks he would receive from his classmates. Possibly disdain or hatred for being such an annoyance on the first day. Doku hung off his shoulder, no longer having a verbal war with Bakugo, but instead hovering over Izuku. He ignored the words the black mass tried to communicate to him mentally, pushing it away in an attempt to not keel over at the moment. Do you have trouble with your quirk? If so, you should really train with it to stop this horrible attitude of it. He froze at the cool words. Izuku pulled himself back up slowly a black-haired female standing a bit too close for comfort. She was taller than himself, her hair pulled back in a spiky, fashion ponytail, and was looking down upon him, her arms crossed over his chest. Izuku turned a dark shade of crimson, ducking away from her while absently nodding his head. Doku growled. Oi, I'm not gonna just sit around and let you diss me. Do go and call me trouble just because the brat has no spine, lips. How uncouth. It's clear that there is a divide in confidence between yourself and whatever this untrained thing is. Thing. Bitch. I will eat you. You should probably get this checked upon. After all, you are in the hero course, right? Izuku's eyes shot open, looking back over to her with surprise. It wouldn't do for you to not do your desired goal just because you're afraid, right? Izuku stood solid as a rock for a moment before he nodded hastily. Hey, don't ignore me. Doku yelled in fury as the black-haired female walked back over to her seat. Izuku turned his eyes as she went to her chair in the back corner of the room, only sitting a few. From his own, he took in a shallow breath, stiffly turning and moving to get back into his seat. Hey man. However, before he could, a hand landed on his shoulder, and Izuku braced for the assault, ducking in on himself and pulling his arms up. Whoa, call down dude, we're not in the training field right now. Just wanted to say hey, and maybe we'll hang out. Later, maybe train? Izuku turned to the red haired boy, the weighed hand still on his shoulder. W what? You know, training, maybe do some work after school. It's always good to have a sparing partner. The young man gave a toothy smile to the green haired boy, who looked upon the nice student with admiration. Hey! The door kicked open, a long head of blonde hair dancing its way into the room. Oh crap! It's Mr. Scream. Oops. Forgot you were in my class now. Whatever, everyone get seated, we're starting new. Bakugo took notes absent mindedly. He already knew about the structure of English sentences and how they designed their flow of words opposite to Japanese. He thumbed his pencil against the paper on his desk, trying not to die of boredom over the class. It wasn't completely lame that present Mike was teaching the class, but he was still surrounded by a group of loser extras taking notes on shit he had to study for months ago in order to get a strong score on his written exam for Ua. To add to all of that, he had to deal with his new least favorite extra, or should he say old extra, Deku. The weakling loser was someone his hag of a mother had pushed onto him when he was a kid. She claimed her and the fucker's mom were friends growing up, so she wanted to make sure her kid had a friend. Peefed, as if. Bakugo went along with it for a while only because it was fun to mess with the unskilled loser and use him to do stuff. He would also sneak some of the more spicy things off of Deku's plate during lunch at school, 
regardless if the worthless kid liked it or not. Then he and Deku got their quirks. After that, it seemed like the shithead's dad came and took even coming over at times when him and Deku were sleeping over at his place. Just to say, something came up, or some shit, he didn't care a huge deal anyhow. Deku was lame, and so was his weird slimy quirk that was scared of Bakugo's sparks. Then he was gone for a while, and his dad had moved or something. The hag raved about it for weeks, especially with the fact that apparently, Inko loved that complex, or whatever. He didn't see Deku anymore, he didn't miss him, not at all. However, after not seeing him for years and practically forgetting about his sorry ass, Deku brought his happy ass to Aldera. And to top it off, he was saying that he wanted to go to Ua. How dare he come back into Bakugo's life and try to one up him? Especially with his lame o quirk that just made his skin black and slimy. Bakugo sent a backwards glance in the other boy's direction, who seemed more distracted at keeping his quirk entertained than taking notes. That black sludge ball got bigger too, huh? And that ugly mug of his was pretty angry looking too. Well, he would have to just show Deku who really belongs at this school. D do I really have to eat this? Yep. We made a deal, remember? Why yeah, but I'm even sure this is safe to eat. I t think I ga gave lunch rush a heart attack. I just met lunch rush and now he probably thinks I'm weird and disgusting. Calm your shit. I've been waiting all day for this. You know as well as I do that I can't really digest stuff while I'm on your shoulder, so unless you want to put me on, you're eating this. I, I know. Izuku sat down with his haphazard tray, his stomach feeling a bit meek at the arrangement of food on his plate, courtesy of the request from Doku. He shivered at the possible taste of the concoction, wondering if he should even use chopsticks or just go American and find a fork. Well, I better get started. Hey, it's really you. Izuku jolted up in his chair, seeing several students walking over to his barren table. One was a tall boy with blue hair, glasses donning his face and a straightforward appearance. The second was a female with dark green hair, her arms bent in an oblong manner, holding her own tray away from her with stretched fingers. The last was the speaker, a girl with bouncy brown hair, a round face, and a cheery look on her cheeks. Her expressive hazel eyes looked him over as she sat down beside him, much to his shock. I was trying to see if my eyes were working, but I think I get it now. You saved me during the entrance exam, right? Izuku didn't know what to do, nor what to say. This was becoming a common occurrence for him it seemed, Doku decided internally. No, that was all me, short stack. The brat didn't do much other than give me control, so I saved your sorry ass. It made a hand with the leftover mass of black, gesturing it over to the distraught boy. You're welcome by the way. Doku grinned at the girl from the boy's shoulder, noting how the three seemed to be caught up in his very unique atmosphere. The girl didn't seem perturbed however, nodding her head and giving both of them a smile. Well, thank you. If it wasn't for you, I don't know if I would have gotten away from that big zero point. I'm Uraraka Ochako. Pleased to meet you, she pointed to the other two individuals, who sat down alongside her and close to the astonished green-haired young man. This is Iida Kun, and this is Asui Chan. Call me Sue. The frog girl pointed out, and I say whatever comes to mind. I must ask, Midoriya Chan. Why does your food look so gross? Izuku sprung up, his body stiffening at the direct question. He looked down at his own meal, embarrassed at what he would be eating for the day. I, um, I, well, this is for me. The brat made a deal, so he's got to soak it up and eat what I want. Doku was getting tired of the constant stuttering, wanting the boy to just get starting on eating, it was getting cold damn it. I must say. The bespectacled boy at Asui's left stated robotically. Your dietary choices of the day are quite unique. I myself would. Have never thought to eat something sweet like caramel with that of a chili sauce on rice. Another thing to bring up is the uniqueness of your quirk. He pointed to the off-put mass of black on Izuku's shoulder. It seems to carry a sense of self-sentience, which is unusual, even with today's variety of quirks. Doku growled at the boy. I'm not an it. I got a name, so use it and start eating, small fry. I'm sure you're as hungry as I am. Izuku, knowing what was to come, simply nodded. He picked up his spoon, taking up some of the strange-looking concoction onto the scoop. Slowly, he brought the sweet and spicy-smelling rice to his lips, taking it into his mouth with a grimace. 
the taste hit the back of his throat and he shuddered, not enjoying the mixture. The three pairs of eyes watching this couldn't help but feel bad for the young man, who continued taking a bite of the foul food. The mass of ebony on his shoulders smirked at them as they moved to begin their own meals, small talk making its way into the group. Including his own brat in the process, classes have been going all right so far. Izuku hadn't made a blunder of himself, only finding himself at a loss for words more often than he liked. He just wasn't used to the idea of people seeking him out for conversation. It was a completely new experience, back in middle school, everyone basically ignored him, other than times where they poked fun at him or made accusations that he didn't have a quirk, then he would just try his best to ignore them and keep I am erm. Doku from going after them just to prove a point. In Ua though, there were other kids here that talked to him. They sought him out at lunch, and even if they were grossed out by his food, he was too. They still talked with him, and filled him in on what happened yesterday. He apparently hadn't missed much, but today was the first class in heroics. It was a bit exciting, especially with who was put on the roster for such a class. The door opened abruptly, a massive man with golden locks flying into the room. I'm coming in through the door like a normal person. Izuku sucked back a breath, his heart stopping at the sight of the famous, the amazing, the unstoppable number one hero. It was all might, in the flesh. Hey, quit yelling, I'm trying to sleep off our meal asshole. Oh, s sorry doku. Whatever, scrub. Izuku watched the man walk to the front of the class, taking large steps, marching like that of a runway up to the podium before twisting around to the rest of the class. His smile was just as amazing as he thought it would be. He was huge, and to think he would be teaching a class here. I teach hero basic training. It is a subject where you train in different ways in order to learn the standards of being a hero. You'll be taking the most units in this class, that meant he would get to see all might a lot, geez, shut your trap, brat, let's get right to it. This is what we'll be doing today. Combat training, and to go with that are these, costumes based on your quirk registration, and requests you sent in before school started. After you change, head over to ground beta. The class was abuzz with excitement, but as everyone scrambled up from their seats to grab their numbered case, Izuku stared at the wall, his stomach turning at the thoughts in his head. He didn't have a costume, and the last time he put his quirk registry down, it was something really vague, like augmented strength. Something he had done to keep eyes off of him at his father's request. Practically everyone was up and out of their seats, grabbing their case and making their way over to the nearest changing rooms. Izuku stood up, wondering if he should talk to All Might. Talk to All Might? About not being prepared for the second day of school? I'd rather die. He tucked in on himself as he walked over to the cases, noting that there was one for him. He doubted there was anything in there. All Might left the room, along with many other classmates. Izuku grabbed up his number, and was surprised by THHT in it. Putting it down on his desk, he shakily pressed the clasps at the front, watching awe as it popped open, and something revealed inside. A set of clothing that he had never seen before, and a note, with a simple message. It's a used set of my youth costume. It should fit you, but don't be surprised if it's loose or tight in some spots. Aizawa. All Might watched with a blazing smile as his students made their way out of the tunnel. From the appearance of many, it was clear. They each had a distinct style that separated them from their counterparts. The arrangement of wild and sporadic colors helped divide them as individuals, with many having established and fierce apparel that helped capitalize on their quirk or fighting style. This was wonderful. He only had about three hours for this class in total, but he was sure he could get through all of them if he made sure to manage his time right. He probably would have saved some time if he had Aizawa tell the students to meet him in the training zone fully geared up, but he needed to make a first impression. He was the symbol of peace and these students would need a good introduction, which is what he had hoped he inspired upon seeing them all for the first time. They say the clothes make the man, ladies and gents. Make clear, from here on out, you are all heroes. He bellowed charismatically, the group of students all showing their pride in who they were, training to be the protectors of the future. That's great everyone. You all look amazing. Now, let's get started, you zygotes. The class nodded along, but before the number one. Hero could begin his next step, he heard footsteps tracking down the hall. Another student, he surmised. As soon as they stepped out, All Might thought he had gotten confused. 
Those clothes, though different, reminded him of someone else. A teacher in fact. The black long sleeve and pants, connected with a silver trim and belt. A pair of white goggles were attached at the neckline, along with a pair of black of white gloves that donned his hands. The only thing missing was a set of scarves, but he was sure he was looking at a miniature Aizawa. A anyhow, he began, ignoring the stylistic choice of the green-haired young man. Let me explain the next course of instruction. The battle training. All Might began his opening, detailing the specifics of how outside combat is more often, but the dangers of indoor and building-based hero missions are more to be prepared for. By going over the differences between the two, with the lack of space and the need for more planning to have success. Inside, All Might gave each of his students a layout of what was to come. All Might explained the rules, not used to the number of questions he was getting, but luckily having a small script ready with what was to be expected of the students. He laid out the rules, going over the building details, the groupings, and the heroes versus villains' objectives. To be honest, it was a bit exhausting, trying to stay on top of a class. He was much better off training with an individual. Having to deal with 19 students on a time crunch was harder than he expected. All Might gave a thumbs up to the class. Now, let's separate you and get this rolling. Izuku stood by his teammate. He was incredibly nervous, given his current situation, but even with his best resolve, could not stop his feet from shifting around, nor from shaking like a leaf at the side of his partner. It seems we'll be working together. I trust that you will put in a good effort to help us have victory today. Yaoyaruzu offered. You uh, yes. Hi. Sai asterisk, just relax, I'm sure it won't be as bad as you seem to think it will be. The black haired female gave him a small smile. Perhaps if you had been here yesterday during the quirk assessment, you would have had a reason to be nervous. She offered evenly, too. Which Izuku nodded with a jolt of his head, having heard about what had happened during lunch. A student was expelled from Aizawa sensei's test. He still had a test to complete at the end of the day, too. If he didn't do well, would sensei expel him, too? He wasn't sure, but at the moment, his mind was spinning with the past, present, and future, trying to find equilibrium with all of the confusion in his head. Hey brat. Doku appeared on his shoulder, giving him a flat expression. Maybe if you shut yourself up, you'd be able to relax. Just a thought. Izuku looked at his quirk for a moment before nodding, taking those words into consideration. Even Doku was handling all of this better than him, which he usually did, so Izuku should at least try to calm down and stay focused. That's right. Being stable and attentive is the best way to be prepared for what may come. As the heroes in this scenario, we should try to keep a level head. I'm sure you and your quirk can do that, correct? Izuku nodded, which Doku growled at the word, quirk, good. Let's pay attention. All Might is speaking. Izuku nodded, turning his head over towards where the famous man stood with two boxes. Each one was branded with the words, hero, or villain signifying the separation of team he dug his hands inside reaching deep for whatever may be in them now then the first fight will be these teams he pulled out two balls from the bins revealing them to the class with a smile plastered on his megawatt face yaoyuruzu nodded izuku's heart seized doku smirked why did it have to be their team this will be fun chapter 7 prove your worth yaoyuruzu looked around the interior of the building noting the best locations to set up defenses. It was similar to a standard office building, with each level being less lockers and intertwining paths, and more rooms to set up base. In her mind, if they set up at the top, their opponents, given who they were, could easily catch them, meaning longer time playing defense, but if they mixed in, possibly setting up on the third floor, there was still enough area to set up guards and barriers to slow them down. She walked around the bends of the building, following the map to where she believed to be the best place to set up. Yaoyuruzu sent a glance back to her partner, who was pressing his fingers together in a meek fashion as he trailed but a few feet behind her, she internally sighed as she turned forward once more, wondering if this was the world's way of making up for her lack of being in the actual Ua. Practical exam. She had a partner whom she knew nothing about, and looked as though he was afraid of his own shadow. Though to be fair, his shadow was pretty aggressive. Midoriya Izuku, the dark horse, came in a day late, did not participate in the assessment, meaning he didn't experience the expulsion, and didn't show his capabilities. 
He was shorter than herself, not very strong looking, and quite nervous all the time. His quirk hung over him strangely, and seemed as crude as Bakugo Katsuki. On the plus side, he didn't seem perverted in any way, nor did he have undeserved bravado. All right, Momo, let's hold out hope, there's a chance that I'm not going to be on my own in this fight against our heroes, try to be friendly, just like you were taught. She rounded a corner, moving up the stairs to get to the third floor of the complex. Midoriya san, I'm going to need your help, understood. Yaoyuruzu stated calmly as she continued up the steps. She heard nothing for several seconds, other than the grip on the rail following behind her. She craned her neck around, giving the green haired boy a raised eyebrow. Did you not hear me? she asked, keeping the exasperation out of her voice. This time, Midoriya vigorously shook his head in confirmation. As he did so, the black mass of his quirk came out from his shoulder once more. You know, when someone asks you shit, you don't just nod. Get over, house rules, and actually speak. Yaoyuruzu didn't approve of the cursing, but still found the words to have the remarks necessary. We're going up to the third floor. There, the bomb will be placed for us by the aid drones and we can begin setup. Do? You uh, hi. Yaoyuruzu hung her head. At least it was a verbal response this time. She twisted around, moving to take another step up the stairs. In her action however, the heel end of her combat lost hold on her current standing. She felt her center of mass tilt, along with her vision. Her eyes widened in surprise at the clumsy move. She was falling down the step. Her mind immediately went to possible things to build. Pull, adhesive, railing, support plank, maybe a. As she willed her quirk to come to life, preparing to build something, she felt a something catch her around her lower waist, stopping her movement. She froze at the contact, her eyes trailing over to the grip on her. Wrapping across her exposed stomach and waist was a pair of sleeved arms. She looked up, her eyes catching the green in her vision, both from the head of hair hanging in her eyesight, as well as the viridian orbs staring back at her. A second passed. Hey Anyo, are you okay? The boy asked. Yaoyuruzu shook her head, pulling herself from the grip of the young man. She felt her cheeks heat up a little bit, but willed away the dusting of pink on her cheeks. She coughed into her hand, pulling her composure back to full. I am quite fine. Let's get set up. Ah, hey, uh, Hi. Look at you kid. First day at school and already sweeping babes off their feet. I'm almost proud, neither students. Looked at each other as they moved towards their defensive location. Had they done so, they would have seen the embarrassment and red hue on one another's face, one being much redder than the other. All right. The hero team may now enter the facility. The timer has started. Uraraka and Siro nodded. With a shot from his elbow and the use of Uraraka's quirk, the two easily flew upwards, with a well placed launch. They managed to hit one of the upper windows, which was in fact opened. Sliding in, the black haired tape user looked around before signaling for his ally to follow just behind. Looks like we landed on the fifth floor. That means we can work our way downwards rather than have to fight our way up. Siro said with a hint of cheer. Uraraka nodded her head, a smile pulling to her face. The two of them began to make their moves downward, checking any of the rooms on their way to the next floor. Being cautious of the top scorer and her ability to make anything, they didn't want to get fooled into thinking that a wall they passed was actually a door disguised and they missed the bomb. It was to this misfortune that they did not find the bomb on the fifth floor, meaning they would need to make rounds on the fourth floor, possibly splitting up if need be, as it got more dense in winding paths the lower the floor. Moving to the fourth floor, they made another round, and halfway through, they weren't having much luck. Ciro sighed. I'm hoping that they didn't set up on the floor one. He said as he round another corner being met with yet another office space. Uraraka nodded, checking their rear for any activity as she looked into another opened room. Then again, it wouldn't be the best thing if we had decided to. Just walk in. Half this fight is finding them, right? She put out, to which her partner in heroism figured was a fair point. As they continued to check rooms, the sound of echoing steps alerted their ears. They hunched down, skulking as they peered around for the source. Out of the corner of her eye, Uraraka jolted her head in the direction, pointing a finger as a figure passed by a hall before disappearing once more. There, I saw something. Ciro nodded, launching forward with tape to get a view of the target as his partner followed on foot. 
With a wrap around the edge of a corner, Ciro slid to a halt as he looked down the hall, his eyes immediately spotting the black clothing on the individual only a few meters from himself. He smirked, recognizing the newest member of his class. He launched a line towards Midoriya, intent on catching him. It was unfortunate that the boy dodged, it instead hitting the wall behind him. It was fortunate that it hit the wall though, as Ciro used the adhesive to pull himself forward with more speed. Hey, don't go too far. We should probably stay together. Ciro pressed a hand to his earpiece. I'll try to catch him. If you can, try to find the bomb and we'll meet up there. Okay. The tape user told his ally, who capitulated with a simple hi, in his ear before cutting off the line of contact. Ciro rounded another corner, and as soon as he did, he spotted his target half hanging out a window, the green haired opponent looking quite nervous. Saying a small sorry in his head, he shot a line of tape as his opponent. Midoriya stumbled as the tape shot towards him. Ciro froze, watching in horror as his opponent floundered out the window. Crap! Midoriya! He called out, his tape flying out the open window, not sticking to his target in order to catch or capture him. He rushed forward, hoping that he wasn't too hurt. The other boy didn't. Look like he had wanted to go out that window. Uraraka ran towards the next hall of stairs having not spotted any bomb or yaoyuruzu during her search on the fourth floor while Ciro chased Midoriya. She knew that they were not out of time yet, probably only little more than five minutes have passed, but that was still a third of their allotted time. She needed to get the location fast, she knew Ciro could find her quick with his tape, then they would be able to work together a Uraraka ground to a halt as she stopped at the end of the staircase. Towering over her was a barrier of weird looking lines and webbing blocking the entirety of the hallway path into the third floor. This wasn't supposed to be here, meaning that Yaoyuruzu probably built it. She pouted at the unfair tactic, pulling her hand up to smack away the disgusting, gunky barrier. She was surprised when her hand smacked against it, it stuck to her. With a pull, several of the gross tendrils held onto her hand. She began swatting at it, shaking her hand vigorously in an attempt to throw it off. It was only after several seconds did it finally release her hand. Uraraka looked at the gross wall in front of her, she probably wouldn't be able to pull it down without getting tangled in it, and if she tried to go through it, she would be a fly in a web. If Ciro were here, then she would be able to get through, as he could use his tape to pull it down. Otherwise, she would have to go to the other stairway that led to the third floor. Her guess, however, was that it was also covered. Ciro, I need a hand here. I need you to meet me at the third floor west stairway, she called into her headset. Ciro ran to the edge of the window, hoping not to find his classmate splayed across the cement down below. A part of him hoped that Midoriya grabbed onto a piece of his tape before dropping out, or that he had some means of tethering himself to safety. Even if this was a fight, he never wished ill will upon the other guy. Pulling his head out the open window, he stared down at the ground, finding nothing of note. No person let alone a trace of Midoriya. His eyes spotted only one thing of note. A groove of five spots, which had pierced the wall near one of the windows. Ciro raised an eyebrow, now noting that he didn't even know the full capabilities of Midoriya's quirk, only that the slime thing hung over his shoulder a lot. Launching a line of tape, he attached it to the spot near the same window with the burrowed grooves. Being careful not to fall, he swung himself down gripping the edge of the fourth floor before dropping, using his tape to catch most of his weight. As soon as he dropped, his looked into the window of what he assumed was the third floor, it was dark, several of the lights having been knocked out by something. Casting a look from side to side, he nodded to himself. He would need to make sure Midoriya wasn't on this floor before checking the next. Uraraka should also be on this floor by now if she hasn't said anything about the fourth having the bomb. Unclasping the window, he perched his feet against the sitting of his hands to grip his tape while he opened the window. It slid open easily, and he made move to quietly sneak in. Only to feel something grab his hand. Ciro immediately flinched at the contact, his concentration lost as he felt a pull grip him into the building. He reacted by trying to launch a line of tape, only to despair. When the grip on him refused to give him the ability to aim, the tape shooting down the hall. He struggled against the grip, which refused to give on its attempt to keep him restrained around the wrist. Ciro, I need a hand here. 
I need you to meet me at the third floor west stairway. Ciro heard in his ear, and immediately tried to come up. With a plan. With a desperate move, he let go of his tape as he swung into the room, knowing that he had a better chance of fighting this thing while he wasn't hanging like a spider on a thread. Aiming his elbow to the side wall in the third floor hall, he hoped to get traction so H could pull away from the villain. As he flew into the room, he didn't account for the grip swinging his weight. With the rotation force as he entered the building, he found himself making a 180 spin. As he swung, his tape shot out, and instead of hitting a wall, just flew down the hall, not having any means to slow down. Immediately, he tensed up as he slammed against the wall adjacent the window. He couldn't hear the slicing of his tape, cutting him off from a possible means of tethering out of the grip of his enemy. Groaning out in pain as the air was knocked from his lungs, Ciro tried to look for the figure through pained eyesight. His eyes met black and white, and Ciro could only to stare in shock at the figure just to his side. Standing there was the thin form of the newest student, his green eyes shining in the sunlight through the window. Holding on one of Ciro's wrists was not simply that of Midoriya's grip, but rather a strange black, viscous form that looked like claws from a beast, the black color immediately reminding the tape user of the little ebony head that hung over the boy's shoulder. S sorry Ciro Kun, said boy's eyes widened when he felt another hand grab around his other arm. His eyes widened when he felt not only the strange hold, but that of material wrapped around both his wrists. One of the heroes has been captured, the time. Remaining is dwindling, so actions must be made on both sides to secure victory. The voice of all might called through the speaker system. Ciro felt the hold on his wrists release, and he breathed in a desperate need of oxygen that he didn't know he needed. I, his ears picked it up. Ciro pulled his vision to the side, where a trembling form hung its head on his shoulders. Ciro was startled. When he saw tears drop down from Midoriya's face, ID didn't want to H hurt you. You, you were so nice to me, A eh, and you didn't even know M me. Midoroya ground out through his stutter. Why you and K Kirishima kun? Siro kun. See, can you ever f forgive me? Uraraka got no reply, and stood there for several moments before giving up on a response. Huffing to herself, she wondered if she could try to reduce the weight of the slimy cords. No good, it was just mean they would float about if she managed to break them, and she had no means of cutting them. She couldn't make herself float, as she would just get tangled in the higher wires. She thought about trying a window, going down to the third floor through there, but without Ciro to act as a bonding agent, she might float away without a way to bring herself down and not hurt herself. She looked to the slimy substance, shivering at the thought, it was her only choice however. Taking both arms, she dug into the center of the web, trying to make a large enough hole to squeeze through, but she found her luck drown away when the opening was only half her size. One of the heroes has been captured, the time. Remaining is dwindling, so actions must be made on both sides to secure victory. Uraraka's eyes widened in shock. Ciro got captured. It was no wonder he couldn't respond then. It also meant that maybe he was attacked by both Midoriya and Yaoyuruzu. This could be a chance to get the bomb while they were distracted. Pressing her hands together, she activated her quirk on herself, allowing he to float and reduce the size of hole needed to fit through. Sliding her way through, she cringed as the sticky gunk stuck to her clothes and body. It clung to her skin-tight bodysuit, giving her another reason to hate the design choice of the support designers. One stuck to the head of her helmet, trying to grip tight to the transparent material, but sliding away eventually and leaving a horrible smear. Gross 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 gross. With a last tug, she slid out of the disgusting trap, happy that the worst of it was finally over. Feeling the last few pieces of cord try to hold on, she struggled against the wire with all she could muster. With the last one snapping away, she felt her stomach grow queasy for more than one reason, and pressed her hands together to deactivate her quirk. Like that, she flopped to the ground, she sighed against the cold cement tiles. She was through, now she could go after the bomb and win for her team, moving to pull her hands away, she found herself struggling against the viscous adhesive once more, and huffed as she attempted to pull her hands away. Why did Yaoyuruzu make such a horrible trap? Something so gross and hard to get through like that shouldn't be fair. Uraraka thought to herself, finding success as she pulled one hand free from the ground. Only for something to wrap around it as it hung in the air. Uraraka snapped upwards. 
Standing above her was the form of the tall, black-haired, creation user, Yaoyuruzu Momo. Her eyes widened and shocked, wondering when she had gotten there. Had she just been waiting for her? Uraraka could not vocalize any of these confusing notions before the same piece of capture tape bound around her other wrist. Siro Kun. See can you ever f forgive me? Siro stared at the green-haired boy with surprise. He had no idea him and Kirishima had that much of an impact on the other boy. All they were doing is greeting him like anyone should. Siro gave an awkward smile to the trembling figure. H hey, it's okay. You don't have to cry over winning. I'm fine. Midoriya pulled his face up to meet Siro, his mouth agape with shock. Ah really? Siro wrung his hands in the capture tape, shaking his head at the strangeness of his classmate. Midoriya seemed pretty cool, if a bit shy. Yeah, man. Don't sweat it, this is a part of class. I'm not going to start hating you because you got me. He smirked at the crying boy. I'll just have to win the next time, nay? Midoriya stared at him for a moment before bringing his hands up to wipe his face. Gone was the strange substance that covered his arms, the black sleeve soaking up the tears as the boy nodded. A black mass formed over the shoulder of the villain, I told you it would be fine. You just seem to forget that shit like this is normal, so stop crying like a baby, it growled out. H. Hi. Midoriya nodded frantically. The hero team has been fully captured. This fight goes to the villain's team. Siro looked down at the ground, slumping forward as he heaved with exasperation. Well, I guess that's that, huh? Congratulations, students, All Might said with signature smile to the two groups of students. Siro and Uraraka stood side by side, one still using a towel provided by Yaoyuruzu to clean herself of the viscous adhesive. On the other side of the symbol of peace stood the villain's team one standing confidently in her victory while the other hunched over himself, a black mass hanging on his shoulder with a cocky, jagged tooth-filled smile. The hero team did a great job in trying to retrieve the bomb, but the villains were able to counter them with an impressive display of capture and traps. Now, I feel that the MVP of this fight goes to Midoriya Shonen, the green-haired boy jolted up in surprise, pointing to himself with a shaky hand. Emmy, He squeaked out, to which the blonde hero gave him a.s. And would anyone like to explain why? All might look to the class for answers. After a moment, a hand peeped up in the crowd. Yes, Jeru showed you. The girl rubbed the back of her head, recounting the fight from her perspective. Well, Siro and Uraraka made a good move trying to scale the building, but separated due to Siro's speed and trying to catch Midoriya. Midoriya captured Siro when he followed, using the window to narrow his opponent's options of combat. Though Yaoyuruzu captured Uraraka with her slimy trap. Jeru shivered at the visual of poor Uraraka climbing through that horrible obstacle. Correct, young lady. Seeing a massive thumbs up sent her way as well, Jeru blushed a bit at the unneeded praise. If I may as well, all might turn to the villain's team, finding a hand raised up from the form of the young female. All might weighed the time versus her explanation and gave her an okay to go ahead. Yaoyuruzu cleared her throat. Before our fight even began, Midoriya came up with the whole plan. Flashback. You um. Yaoyuruzu san. Yes, Midoriya san? Yaoyuruzu asked, placing down another layer of metal defense in front of one of the doorways. Do you happen to K know the Q quirks of our opponents? Midoriya fidgeted with his hands, not knowing what to do with them for the moment. Yaoyuruzu nodded. Siro san can produce tape from his elbows. Launching it forward as a means to grapple or vault around. Uraraka can turn off the gravity for anything she touches, possibly even herself, but that last part is unknown. Why, did you have something? In mind? It was to the creation girl's surprise that the green haired boy in front of her nodded in confirmation. I, I think I'll be able to come up with a way to W win. Flashback end. Midoriya figured out the best ways to counter our opponents after I told him about their quirks. He figured that Siro and Uraraka would use their quirks right from the beginning, thus prepared himself on a higher floor and waited. He then separated them by understanding that Siro would be able to tether behind him, leaving Uraraka to find another way after he would get down through the window. With that in mind, he also asked me to build a spool of wires and liquid rubber cement adhesive. He set up glue traps at both hall. Openings to the third floor, 
knowing that if Siro wasn't with Uraraka, she would have no real way of getting through without making a mess of herself. That gave me a chance to check both traps, finding her just after she escaped, but still covered enough for me to capture her. Yaoyuruzu looked to the awestruck boy beside her. I had a plan to win, and it had a good possibility of success, but Midoriya made our chances improve by a substantial amount. She smiled at the other boy, who ducked his head away at the overly kind words. And no, it w wasn't all m me, I, wow, Midoriya kun, you really did all that? Uraraka bounced over to the other boy, amazed that he figured all of that out without even knowing how their quirks really worked in person. You're incredible, the gravity girl said with excitement. Said boy only became more red at the words. Yeah, I figured you were following Yaoyuruzu. Siro brought up. It's kind of scary how you got us both, he chuckled. S scary? Midoriya yelped out in surprise, the word never having been associated with him before. Relax, brat. Try not to faint on me. It'll only mean I have to carry your sorry butt around all day. Midoriya nodded to his quirk. All Might coughed, getting everyone's attention once more. All right. Let's get rolling with the next group of teams. Hi. Everyone yelled out. In the back of the group, a pair of red eyes narrowed at the still red-faced Midoriya, the black mass hanging on his shoulder as several people praised his ability. Looking away, his hands itched with the need to blow something up. He was getting tired of waiting already and wanted to prove all these nobodies just how out of their level they really were compared to him. Deku was nothing, and he would prove it once he got the chance. Izuku had been really nervous about fighting anyone, let alone the person that apparently Doku saved, and the first person to say anything nice to him. Siro and Uraraka were really kind, and had a hard time during the fight trying to justify hurting them in any way. He was still hung up over how hard he had thrown Siro against the wall when he swung in the window. He wasn't all that good with Doku's strength, so it was an accident. Oi, don't go blaming me for those other shitheads getting hurt. I know. I need to practice more. I need to get stronger too. Clearly. You almost fell out of that window. Had it not been for my strength, you would be paced on the road. Doku huffed in Izuku's head, as if crossing his arms in irritation. I still wish we could have fought someone stronger, like that guy's with the multiple arms. He seems like a fun challenge. Instead, I was let down by how easy those two were beaten. It's n not their fault, we just came up with a g good way to beat them. Yeah, and you're supposed to do that with every poor sap you face off against. Izuku neither confirmed nor denied the statement made by Doku, instead focusing on the screens in front of him, upright now were. Teams F and H, which were Asu Su, and another boy with a head of a bird. They were facing off against the boy in the yellow costume which resembled a luchador, and an angular-faced boy with a mouth on his red and yellow uniform. Izuku continued to watch, wanting to learn more about his class, how they fought, and what they were each like. He was a part of it now, apparently, and he wanted to get to know more about each them. Maybe even make a few friends, something that sung in his heart. A luxury that was not given to him in quite some time, considering how much people made fun of him in the past. But Uwa was a new start, and it had been so inviting as of today. It was still incredibly weird, considering that he was in a hospital only a day ago, to think that he not only got accepted, but that he was standing here with his class, having just fought and was getting to watch more of his classmates contest each other was incredible. He pressed a hand to his chest, gripping at the black long sleeve over his heart. He was here, and it made him feel like he was on the top of the world. What the fuck? Is this asshat copying me? Izuku was ripped from his thoughts as a pair of white pupil less eyes glared at the display screens. Izuku looked to the screens as well, finding what Doku was talking about. In the upper corner of the screens, hanging out of the chest of the bird headed boy was another bird like figure with massive shadowy claws. He was holding back the yellow spandexed opponent while his teammate was attempting to slip around to reach the bomb. Izuku's mouth was agape as he stared at the screens. I is there really someone like me here, oh please, he's just a cheap knockoff. Still, maybe we could talk to him about his quirk. Maybe who his quirk is. It w wouldn't hurt, right? Oh sure, add birdbrain to your Brady bunch of idiot pals, why don't Shaw? Yeah, maybe I could. Oi, I was joking, brat. Brat. Brat, are you ignoring me? And no, Doku. Yeah, you better not. 
Izuku continued to watch. He stayed silent as both teams moved around one another, the heroes managing to slip around the angular-faced student and charging for the door that led to the bomb room. The boy with the bird-like head, released his ally once more, who fought in front of him and guarded his ally from the assault of the yellow student again. Izuku's eyes were glued to him as the shadowy figure threw off the aim of the much stronger boy as Su jumped over to the bomb. The hero team wins. UA really was fantastic, the end.